Javier, did you do the thing? Now, good afternoon. I want to call this work session of the Durham City Council to order at one o'clock on Thursday, uh, December the 10th. I want to welcome everyone here today. We're really glad to have you. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freelon. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Middleton. I am here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. We'll now proceed to announcements by members of the council. Any announcements, colleagues? Councilmember Caballero. Yes, I just wanted to um, discuss a little bit with our community now that we've moved into orders from the governor about stay at home from 10 p.m. to 5, 5 a.m. And also just reminding folks in the community we are in holiday season. I know for Latinos, there's Posadas and Noche Buena. And I am pleading with folks to please do those things virtually, really limit family gatherings. We're seeing uh, a real big increase in Durham County that is quite frankly frightening. Um, my sister lives in Tucson, Arizona and Pima County and the death and COVID rates that they're seeing out there is just devastating. And I would hate to see that happen in Durham County. We have been blessed with great leadership both at the state and local level. And we have been able to withstand the worst parts of the pandemic up to now. And I would hate for us to lose all the ground that we have achieved these last really, really challenging months. I cannot stress how important the next two to three weeks are in Durham. And I know we wanna see family and I know that it's important for many folks. There's lots of celebrations happening. Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, just stay home. It's not worth it. It's not worth not getting to see your family next year, all of them because of what you accidentally brought into a gathering, uh, whether you were asymptomatic and you weren't sure, you maybe had a little slight something that was not a cold and you, you went to a gathering and got others sick. Um, I also wanna say that I've asked, uh, the administration have asked staff for them to bring a presentation to council. And I wanted to let you all colleagues know on both the green, Greenlight app that the city will be using and is using. Uh, I've been privileged to see that presentation twice. I think all of us could benefit from it. it takes not very much time. And then secondly, an, um, an update on, on the vaccine and what we can expect to see in Durham. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. Other announcements today? Council member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon to you, and good afternoon, colleagues, and everyone that's watching and, and tuning in with us. Happy holidays uh, to everyone. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Council Caballero for her, her admonitions and uh, directives. I want to fully associate myself with them and lean in and uh, put emphasis uh, on them and thank her for that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, last week was my first uh, board meeting with the Durham Arts Council as the city's uh, official representative uh, to the Durham Arts Council, so I want to Thank my colleagues for allowing me to carry our banner. Uh, in that context, the bar has been set very high uh, by, by previous representatives, uh, namely one Charlie Reese, uh, who uh, his impact was made heavily there at the Durham Arts Council. So I will try my best uh, to keep up to the standard of the established there. I also want to acknowledge the other uh, electeds that have been making their mark there, Senator Mike Woodard, who's a great patron and champion of the arts. And uh, I'm proud to be working alongside Commissioner Heidi Carter as well, representing the county. Uh, there in the Arts Council. So I want to thank uh, them and I want to 
plug uh, something this holiday season. Council Caballero is right. We should be staying home. So a lot of us will be doing our shopping online. Uh, and the Durham Arts Council has a winter wonderland auction going on. So if you're looking for some really cool gifts, somebody that's on my nice list, uh, hopefully will be getting something uh, from the Durham Arts Council uh, auction. You can go to the Durham Arts Council Facebook page. Uh, and then there's a link where you can uh, uh, click for a winter wonderland online auction. So everybody watching this broadcast today, if you're in the midst of your holiday shopping, uh, the auction will be going on to December 15th. This is some place where you can get some really unique uh, gifts um, and art. And we know that uh, uh, art has a tendency to appreciate. Hopefully the artist won't have to die uh, first, but, but you can get some pretty unique gifts. Uh, so I wanna encourage everyone to support our Durham Arts Council. We know that um, uh, one of the marks of a truly great metropolis, well, there are several of them. You can't really be a truly great metropolis without being accessible without a car, you have to be a safe place. But what really makes a city pop is what's going on in its art scenes and, and stuff like that. And one of the reasons why Durham enjoys such a great reputation uh, is because of our art scene here. So I hope that uh, all of us will um, be supporters of the Durham Arts Council and will go uh, check out uh, that online auction as you do your holiday shopping. So thank you for that. Secondly, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to, uh, again, send out uh, condolences and, and heartfelt um, concern to family members of uh, one of the members of our community who were slain, uh, slayed last night uh, in the shooting, uh, and to continue to just give a voice uh, to the continued issue of gun violence um, in our city. Um, the cold weather does not seem to be um, mitigating or ameliorating uh, the issue uh, here in our city. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, this council for the leaning in that we've been doing. I know we've got a number of things in the pipeline so on today, I, I'd just like to uh, ask um, for some type of forecasting from the staff of when we can expect to hear back. And I know they're working diligently. This is not chastisement. This is not um, um, complaint. And please, it's not complaint in any way, but I, I would like some type of forecasting as to when we expect to hear back on the items that are in the pipeline, particularly uh, the violence interruption expansion uh, and Bull City United is where we are uh, on that as we are, we are um, things seem to be ramping up uh, rather than getting better uh, in terms of violence, even with the weather, even with COVID. Um, so I just wanna keep us focused on, on this issue uh, because with all the great things going on in our city, as I've said before, I believe that if we don't get a handle on this issue, it will eclipse the prevailing narrative of our city as emergent uh, and descendant. And no one, no one wants to see that happening. I know we're the biggest brand ambassadors our city has that sits on this council. Um, so uh, I hope that we'll lean into that. Uh, and look to that for the staff, look from that for the staff. Uh, that's it, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for the time. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you very much, council member. I think what I'll do, um, I will ask uh, Manager Page that uh, at uh, perhaps at the end of the meeting, she could uh, give us that schedule for what she's thinking about. So in case she needs to check with staff about, in the meantime, about what they're thinking in terms of scheduling that. But thank you, council member. All right, uh, any other announcements? Council Member Freeman. Thank you, I apologize. I was a few minutes off trying to get from one Zoom to the, to the next, I apologize. And uh, I just wanted to thank Council Member Caballero for also um, enlightening or sharing those insights as it's important to note that we should be staying home and staying safe, um, acknowledging the three W's and waiting, washing hands and, and keeping ourselves um, uh, very uh, <laughs> informed about how things are going, wearing a mask and all the other things. I um, just wanted to note that um, I, it's unfortunate that we have to keep continuing to have the conversation, but I think it's important that we do. And acknowledging that my neighbors have been raising um, a flag and asking for a lot more help, um, acknowledging that there's been at least five or six of these shootings in my neighborhood and folks are afraid uh, they're concerned. Uh, we're directly speaking with the residents in the 900 um, East Main Street uh, apartment complex where a number of them have occurred in the last two weeks. And the fear that people have with the bullets going into their homes and the concern that they have with their kids outside, I'm not sure how to address it, but I do know that the chief has been very supportive and making sure that folks know that they are there and they will um, they will be on top of doing the investigations and trying to get to the bottom of it, but they do need community support to make sure that the folks who are responsible are identified. 
I would also like to note that uh, in the coming, uh, I guess in the next couple of weeks or so, we have our next work session. I would love to be able to bring forward a resolution around Crown or the Crown Act, um, just acknowledging uh, that uh, HB2, the ban on uh, passing ordinances or any legislation around discrimination has been uh, lifted and it would be nice to move forward with a ban on uh, discrimination regarding uh, natural hair. And it's, uh, I, will, I would uh, love for anyone and everyone who's interested to reach out to let me know if they would like to support or like to offer any insights, but I will be developing a resolution to bring forward. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that I added that to the next agenda or acts if that, I'm not, acts if that was okay to bring to the next uh, work session meeting. Thank you, council member. I really appreciate you raising that. It's not an issue I know about, and uh, but I'm happy to hear about it. Colleagues, are we good with that? I see some well, thumbs. You, Mr. Mayor, the, um, it's, the crown stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. Okay. So I w we'll definitely have the conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Any more announcements? Okay, thank you very much. We'll now move to priority items by the city manager. Madam manager, welcome. Here. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the Durham City Council. I do have one uh, priority item, and I also ask that the city council suspend uh, the rules and vote on this item today at the work session. It is a supplemental item, agenda item number 24. It is the city county interlocal agreement to receive Durham County financial contribution to the Durham CARES small business grant program. Thank you very much, Madam Manager. You have heard the manager's priority items. Can I hear a motion that we accept the item? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by, count, by, by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Council Member Freelon. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton? I vote aye. Councilmember Reese? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. And Madam Manager, we will um, we'll, we'll suspend and vote. Uh, we'll take that up when we get to the aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Attorney, we have Don O'Toole with us today representing the city attorney's office. Are there any priority items today? Uh, there are no priority items from the city attorney's office. Thank you, Mr. Attorney. All right, and now we'll hear from uh, the city clerk. Madam Clerk, are there any priority items? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and council members. I do have two um, priority items. We do not need to vote, but I wanted to let you know that under PR number 14348, the Workers' Rights Commission, we have received a um, final version of the Workers' Bill of Rights, and that's been added to the agenda. And then there is PR number 14344, which is the, um, the balloting for the Safety and Wellness Task Force. That ballot was updated. Um, there were a couple revisions that were required, and it has been emailed to council. And I wanted to Thank let you know those two items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We, we, I think there was some confusion about that ballot, but when we get to that item at the end of the meeting, if we need to discuss it further, we will. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we'll move to our administrative consent items. Under the city clerk's office, item one, Raleigh-Durham Airport Authority, mayor's nominee for reappointment. Item two, safety and wellness task force appointments. Item three, under city council's office, discussion of the Workers' Bill of Rights is written by the Durham Workers' Rights Commission. Um, I'm gonna pull that item. Uh, Item four, interlocal agreement with Go Triangle to reimburse the city of Durham for the technical services related to the commuter rail. Under Department of Water Management, item five, Department of Water Management, Miss Lake Facility Expansion Design Services, Stantec Architecture, 
Incorporated, Amendment Number Five. Item Six: Williams Water Treatment Plant Paving Construction Award to S.A. Hauling and Utilities Limited Liability Company, Doing Business as Creative Concrete Construction. Can you pull that? Item, item Six. Uh huh. Um, item seven, water plant residual and wastewater plant biosolid services contract with Sinagro Central LLC. I'm going to pull that item. Item eight, under finance department, contract for insurance broker services. Uh, item nine, under fleet management, cooperative group purchase contract, five automated refuse collection vehicles. And item 10, cooperative group purchase contract, police patrol vehicles. Under General Services Department, item 11, contract with Clegg's Termite and Pest Control, LLC for pest control services. Item 12, contract with Godwin Elevator Company, Inc. for elevator maintenance and repair services. Under the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, item 13, City of Durham Employment and Training 2018-2020, grant project ordinance superseding project ordinance 15613. Under the Police Department, item 14, 2020 Blue Benevolence Grant Project Ordinance. Item 15, the U.S. Depart Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance, 2020 National Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, SACI Program Grant Project Ordinance. Mr. Mayor, Project I don't want to pull it. I just mm -hmm. wanted to comment on how uh, just, I'm so glad that we are getting more funding for this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Item 16, expansion of fiber optic network agreement with Duke University construct the Durham Housing Authority campus network. I'm gonna pull that item. Um, under presentations, Department of Transportation item 17, Greater Triangle Commuter Rail GTCR study update. Item 18, update on Durham County Transit Plan. Item 19 under public hearing, City County Planning Department, Consolidated Annexation, Carrington Woods 2. Item 20, Consolidated Annexation, 924 Old Oxford Road. Item 21, Consolidated Annexation, 551 Olive Branch Road. Item 22, Consolidated Annexation, 4115 Andrew Avenue. Under Citizens Matters to be heard at one o'clock, item 23, Brandon Williams. Under Supplemental Items, Office of Economic and Workforce Development. City County, item 24, City County Interlocal Agreement to receive Durham County financial contribution to the Durham CARES Small Business Grant Program. This final item, our uh, manager has asked us to suspend the rules and vote today. As you all know, the CARES Act funding must be out the door by uh, December the 31st. Uh, the county has, uh, you, is, like us, they have been trying to make sure they're expending all of their CARES Act funding for positive purposes. And uh, in addition to the uh, roughly same amount of money that we contributed uh, to the um, small business program uh, recently, they have also at, want to add another $250,000. So I'm going to now ask if there's a motion that we suspend the rules and vote on this item. Move to suspend. Move, moved by Councilmember Freeland, seconded by Councilmember Freeman. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Aye. Councilmember Caballero? Aye. Councilmember Freelon? Aye. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? I vote aye. Councilmember Reese? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now, uh, is there a motion that we authorize the city manager to execute the interlocal agreement with Durham County? So no, that's please. Moved by Councilmember Middleton. Second, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Freelon. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. I want to say to Mr. Pettigrew and others from his department who are here today, we very much appreciate you all springing into action to get this money out the door to our businesses. Uh, I know that we've already gotten the first half out the door. Um, and congratulations on that. And, and the fact that your department did it and we didn't contract it out, you had to take on the additional burden is much appreciated, Mr. Pettigrew. 
All right, um, we'll move now to our pulled items. Madam Manager, the items I have pulled are, th oh, no, I'm sorry, we're gonna have the Citizens Matters, but let me first review what we've got pulled. Three, six, seven, and 16. Is that what you have, Madam Manager? That is what I have, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I apologize. I was seeking recognition to have item 14 pulled. I think I made it about I'm lost. I'm sorry, my, my fault. I'm no sorry word. I didn't hear that. Thank you. So we'll make that three, six, seven, 14, and 16. Let me just make sure I know which 14 is the Blue Benevolent Square Project. Okay, great. Yes, sir. Thank you. So we've got three, six, seven, 14, and 16. Thank you, Councilmember. Sorry I missed you. Thank you, Madam Manager. All right. Um, we'll now move to Citizens Matters. And uh, we have one uh, person who has signed up today. Um, and that is Mr. Brandon Williams. Mr. Williams, are you available to be heard? I am. We're glad to have you, Mr. Williams, uh, and you have three minutes. Thank you, uh, Mayor Schull. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the City Council. My name is Brandon Williams, and I'm a resident of the Walltown neighborhood, speaking today on behalf of the Walltown Community Association. In December of 2018, a group of neighbors and I spoke before you to express our concerns about the sale of Northgate Mall to Northwood investors, specifically emphasizing how the redevelopment of the property would continue to displace people and undermine black wealth by elevating the already increasing property taxes and rents in our community. After that meeting, we launched an organizing effort outlined for you on the second page of the presentation I submitted. This is a multiracial, multi-generational, multi-class, all volunteer effort rooted in generations of black working class families in Walltown who in the face of structural racism have embodied a spirit of self-determination and resilience. Over the last two years, we've developed a vision based on the hopes, desires, and experiences of Walltown residents, centering the people who have been and will continue to be most impacted by gentrification in the geographic area surrounding Northgate Mall. Then we branched out to the six other neighborhoods that surround the mall to strengthen our efforts and build collective power. This collective power is reflected in the design of three alternative maps for the new Northgate that were created by the Northgate Mall Neighborhood Council, which includes representatives from Walltown, Northgate Park, Duke Park, Trinity Park, Trinity Heights, Watts Hospital Hillendale, and Old West Durham. These maps reflect the goals laid out in Walltown's strategic vision and provide an alternative to the map shared by Northwood back in September of this year. Last month on November 14th, we held an outdoor community meeting to reveal those maps and launched a survey to gather input and help us validate and clarify our priorities in the redevelopment process. As you can see on the second to last page of the presentation, the overarching and consistent theme is connection to the community. Connection is created by fostering an inviting and welcoming place for all Durham residents. Specifically, four priorities have emerged and are of the utmost importance in our efforts. Each of these priorities is supported by preliminary findings from our survey based on 311 responses from residents across the city. First is affordable housing, which means that the affordable units developed on the property be priced for people at or below the Walltown median income of $37,000, which means that they will need to be at 30 to 40% of the Durham Chapel Hill area median income of 90,000. We know that this is a tall order, but it's necessary for affordability to be meaningful for our neighbors. Second is affordable retail, which requires advocating for a grocery store, maybe a co-op providing ownership for local residents and set asides for non-chain local businesses. Third is accessible community center design, which means advocating for a community park and green space that opens up a long guest road connecting the Walltown Park to the property. And there's also a strong desire for dedicated community space, such as a library branch with the Walltown History Hub. Fourth is environmental sustainability, which means instilling measures to reduce stormwater runoff and excessive flooding on the property and surrounding area. Recently, we have begun to engage the Northwood team around how to implement these priorities in the development process. Our next meeting with them is in early January. Uh, however, these conversations are still early. Um, and while we hope that we can find a way to meet our expectations, we are asking for the council's continued support in pursuing an equitable redevelopment process one that centers the folks most impacted by gentrification and ensuring that the new Northgate is a place where all Durham residents can live, work, shop, eat, learn, and play. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. You have been a great leader. 
Um, and we're all very appreciative of your efforts and very supportive of your efforts. And I hope you'll continue to call on us um, as you all move forward. And just want to express my appreciation to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, will do. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to add my thanks uh, to you, Brandon, for the amazing work that you've done. Um, we actually haven't spoken in a while about this and since we met at uh, Northgate Mall a while ago, but I followed along the organizing efforts that you've been making uh, with your neighbors. And it's just really astonishing to have come up with these alternative plans um, is just pretty amazing. I wanted to ask you uh, about the substance of your uh, interactions with the developers uh, so far. Like what, what's that been like? Yeah, so um, it, it's it's taken some time, but we've we've found recently a rhythm to um, get engaged. So I would say we we met probably early on in you know April of twenty nineteen, kind of soon after the purchase, um, and then it probably was another eight or so months before we um, engaged with them again when we launched our strategic vision this past February. Um, and then we hadn't had a meeting um, since right after that time, February, March, um, you know, until this past November. So, um, you know, we weren't able to kind of get some connection around our charrette. We had a design charrette um, where members of the city county planning department in Duke came um, and uh, in, in other neighborhoods we weren't able to get coordinated on schedules for that, so they could, did not attend that. Um, and then we had our uh, reveal for the community maps um, on the 14th as well, that they weren't able to attend. Um, but, but soon after that, we were able to kind of work out a meeting, and we've been able to have two recently. So I've been encouraged by the fact that we've been able to get kind of on, on the same page in terms of meeting recently, um, and we have our, an another meeting set for January. So. Um, you know, I think it was a bit uh, choppy at first, but we've, we have seemed like we're in a, in a better space in terms of getting a, an established rhythm that can have some consistency. Um, so, that, so that's where we're at now. Brandon, I, I'm really glad that, uh, that you guys are able to start having those conversations, and I hope that you'll keep giving us updates about how that process is going, um, because it'll be important for us to know uh, the status of that relationship and their receptiveness to these really important uh, ideas and uh, really requirements that uh, that you and your neighbors have come forward with. One last question. Um, you have said you were hoping that the council would be supportive. What, what, what would that look like to you? What could we do as individuals, as a city council to support you, the vision that you and your neighbors have uh, for Northgate? Yes, yeah, great question. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's emerged, I know for us as we begin to think about the affordability in terms of, of housing there, um, is the fact that uh, making affordable units that can um, connect with at the AMI at the level that we need um, will likely require some creativity in terms of the funding and how that happens. Um, obviously, the, you know, the developer um, we'll, we'll, we'll bear the, the brunt of that. Um, but just, you know, wondering, curious, any ideas uh, folks may have to other kinds of resource, resources we can tap into for that process would be helpful. Um, and then I think the second is, you know, the, the, the clarity around kind of the zoning, right? Like the, the, the leverage that we have as residents is that the zoning on the property only allows 50 feet of height currently we know that the developer wants that height to be increased um, and would like uh, you know, a change to be made. Um, and we've been grateful that the, the council has encouraged them to you know, connect with community um, in the process. Um, and that you know, we just firmly believe we don't want that height to be granted without um, you know, meeting expectations around the priorities that uh, we, we set forth. Um, but we've, we have also shared to them if the priorities can be met, then, you know, we would be open to, um, open to the height. So uh, I think just support it in, in those two ways, like, you know, to continue to express that it's important um, for 
um, for community voice to be uh, heard and implemented, incorporated into the design uh, as we move forward. Um, and, and if you can help us in terms of trying to figure out some creativity around the affordable uh, housing, it would be great. Great. Well, Brandon, I, I don't want to, I know we've got a long agenda ahead, but Brandon, if you wouldn't mind dropping uh, the council an email with contact information for the folks you're working with at Northwood, um, uh, I'd, I'd love to, to reach out to them uh, and talk to them about how important uh, it is to me that they continue to work with you and your neighbors about this. Uh, and on the affordable housing front, um, you might want to try to set up some time to meet with the folks in our community development department who are intimately familiar with all of the strategies that can be deployed to develop affordable housing in a particular project. Um, we're using a ton of them right now in Durham um, and uh, so I'd, I'd be happy to provide you with that information so you can make that work. But Brandon, most importantly, just thanks again for all the work that you and your neighbors are doing to really focus on how a, particularly propo a particular area in our city can really benefit from redevelopment, but it has to be uh, community-centered, uh, community-led, um, and you have done all the heavy lifting for them to figure out what you and your neighbors want and what you think will help. Uh, which is a huge gift. Uh, so thank you. Uh, they should be saying thank you. Uh, so uh, let's let's keep the community, let's keep the conversation going. But again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, thank you Council Kelsey. Member. Council Member Freeman. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate Council Member Reese's comments. It's um, insightful. I really appreciate uh, Brandon and his neighbor's work, Brandon Williams and his neighbor's work on, on this site. I'm concerned though within COVID that the binary conversation around whether the focus on community um, priorities or just build at 50 feet might be sending the wrong message. I'm um, acknowledging that there's such a financial um, kind of concern around whether or not they'll be able to build. Uh, I would love to have a, a a more robust conversation of, of this, if we could bring this back as an item so that we are actually involved in that conversation because I feel like there's a miss if we let this site get built without the priorities included at all because they just build at 50 feet. Because um, I mean, by right, they could just build and it will be in place. Um, there's not much that the community would have um, say so on in that case. And I would much rather have a more robust conversation where there's actual options laid out for how much height or how much, um, how much willingness for flexibility around um, some of the, the, the priorities based on the cost um, might be in place. Uh, I, I know I've had some of the conversations with Northwood Raven and they've been very open and, um, and, engaging, acknowledging that they hired a local firm to do some of the community engagement work. Um, and I know that Brandon uh, has, Brandon uh, Williams has held a few community meetings and I've attended those and I've felt, and I've expressed this a, a number of times that, you know, it's good that we have the community charrettes, but when the developer, um, as in my case in my neighborhood, decides just not to build, it doesn't benefit us at all. Or, when the developer decides that they're gonna go ahead with their plan and not include any of your suggestions, uh, that also doesn't benefit us. And I, I just wanna note that this is not a push to make it more expensive on the developer, it's a push to be in partnership with the developer. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that message was sent and we weren't just leaving it as a very binary do what the community says or not or else, um, cause that doesn't feel right. So thank you. Thank you very much council member. All right, thank you. Mr. Williams, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time. All right, colleagues, we're now gonna to move to the poll items. Item three um, has a presentation uh, with it. Uh, and so we're gonna to try to go ahead and do the other poll items first that I think we can dispense of quickly uh, so we can let our staff uh, leave the meeting and get back to doing the work that they are, they'd rather do. Uh, okay, um, we will begin then with item six. Item six is Williams Water Treatment Plant Paving Contract. And I believe that was pulled by Council Member Freeman, is that correct?
Yes, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Council Member. Yeah, I just have a clarifying question, noting that I, I do believe that this is the, the workforce statistics for the hauling company and not for the Van Hook trucking, but it wasn't clear. There wasn't a title at the top to make it to indicate that, and I just wanted to get ver verification on it. Um, no, that, that's the statistics for the company itself. It's a relatively small company. Okay, and that's on the, the, the SA hauling, not Van Hook? Correct. Okay. And is it, I mean, are you in the practice of gathering the information from Van Hook trucking as well? Uh, we can certainly get that, provide that, and put that um, prior to the council meeting and get that on, on a memo. That was pretty much it. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, council member. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. All right, we'll move on now to item seven. Uh, item seven is an item that I pulled. This is the water plant residuals and wastewater plant biosolids contract. Uh, Mr. Greeley, um, at the South Dorm Water Recre Reclamation Facility, are we also building a city-owned dewatering plant there? Um, yes, good afternoon. Uh, Apologize for item six. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council, Don Greeley, Water Management. Um, uh, currently, we have um, we store our biosolids on the um, a pad there for land application. Um, the residuals management we have at the water treatment plants um, that we just completed our um, uh, construction work on those facilities, and we're, we're still. Um, working on trying to get them working and, and you know, optimize them since they're new processes coming online. Um, but, you know, we're, we're asking for this con the contract extension basically with Synergrow. It's a one-year contract because we're just finishing up the existing contract to be able us to work through um, bringing those new facilities at the water plants online, um, continue to work with solid waste over uh, their efforts uh, in dealing, you know, working with the biosolids and the yard waste um, at the North Durham pad. And, and, and once we have that all worked out, which we believe we'll, we'll do in the next 12 months, then we would know exactly what we need to bid out on a long-term contract. That was that, thank you. That, yeah, I mean, I think this plan is, is excellent. It makes a lot of sense to me to do this for another year. And I, I, I get that and I appreciate it. I'm trying to understand, I understand that at the North Durham, we're, as I understand it, we're not planning to compost biosolids at the South Durham Water Reclamation, Reclamation Facility. And of course, unlike Durham, North Durham, it's not next to our solid waste facility. So what I'm trying to understand is how are the biosolids from the South Durham Recreation Facility disposed of? And are we going to have a dewatering plant there also? down in the southern part, in the southern facility? Um, they currently are already dewatered to create the biosolids. And um, currently our biosolids at the South Durham are land applied. Um, and during the upcoming year, we'll be doing a, an overall biosolids residuals master plan to look at long-term where we head with those, um, whether we have kind of a comparable, continue on what we have now, or actually do, um, a kind of a sludge dryer facility that would create a class A fertilizer with our biosolids as opposed to land applying. So we'll be looking at that in the next year or so. And that will include the South Durham biosolids as well as the North Durham? Uh, it will be, hopefully we'll have the successful program with Atlas. Um, so we wouldn't have to use it for um, North Durham, but just for South Durham. And if we are unsuccessful with folding our residuals from the water plants into the Atlas program. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Council Member Reese. Thank you. Hi, Don. How are you today? Yeah. So when we talk about biosolids, um, I guess, especially at South Durham, is that when they're making the cake? Is that what that's called? Yes. Okay. Friends, I've been on a tour of the South uh, Water Reclamation Facility. I've seen them baking the cake. You don't want that cake. It's a bad cake. <laughs> Uh, it was it was a hit with my then third grader. Um, I went on a class trip with her uh, because it was the most horrible smelling room I've ever enter, entered into in my life. Uh, and she and all her friends agreed. We had a good laugh and coughing fit after we left. Um, so that's great. This sounds like a fantastic idea. Don, I wanted to ask you about 
uh, the slightly unusual procedural posture that this item brings to us. This is uh, the, it, it comes to us through the, um, the waiver of the finance policy. Can you talk a little bit about why that's necessary? Because I'll be honest with you, I don't remember us, I don't remember seeing another one of those in my time on the council, probably been a bunch of them and I've just not noticed, but this time I noticed. So can you talk us through that a little bit? Uh, certainly, we, we, we've had brought forward um, with some items, some rebuilding of some of our equipment by the initial vendor. Um, the belt presses at North Durham and South Durham, we got the exception because those needed to be re rebuilt by the manufacturing company themselves. So, um, oh, okay. but um, this is unique. Um, we are finishing up a, a contract with Cinegro. They already have all of their um, uh, facilities at the Brown plant um, already mobilized. There's very few companies that do this. We've bid this out in prior years four different times. Only once did we have um, another company bid because it's a very specialized service. And that company, the, the second bidder in that was um, from an employee of Cinegro who recently tried to start his own company. <laughs> so we, we've seen very little um, competition in here just because there's so few companies that are doing this because it's so specialized just for um, basically wastewater operations, you know, throughout the, throughout the state. And um, the fact that uh, they've already have a lot of their equipment mobilized, we, we would get some cost savings without having to go out. Um, so we figured we'd save money and just, and, and just for it's one, you know, one year, we thought it was appropriate to, to go this way as opposed to bidding. Thanks, Don. I'm so, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. I think also, uh, Mr. Greeley, you felt, as I remember the memo also, and I may have this wrong, but that Cinegro would have such a big advantage already having their facility constructed there and that any other bidder would have to put in, a, you know, another million bucks or something. Uh, am I right about that? Correct, because they've already mobilized their facilities. They, they, have a dis they would have a distinct advantage, price advantage over anybody else who would have to mobilize in their equipment. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Greeley. It's really nice to see you. Thanks for being with us. Hi guys, thank you. All right, uh, we'll now move to item 14, and this was pulled by Council Member Middleton, and this is the 2020 Blue Benevolence Grant Project. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let's see who we have with us, Council that? Member. Um, do we have someone here from the police department who will be um, addressing this item? Yes, Keisha Preston. Okay, great. Ms. Preston, welcome. We're glad to see you. Thanks for being here. Yes. Council thanks. Member Middleton, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Ms. Preston, good afternoon. Good to see you. I am... Um, I, I read the memo and, and um, did no issues with, with the program stuff, but I have a couple of questions about um, how do we determine the, the funding levels? What is the methodology to say this year is 25, this year it's 50, this year it's 30? Could, could you explain that to me? Um, yes. We have based it on the amount of donations that we have received from the public um, mm -hmm. So this, this recent year during our national night out, we got significantly more funding than we have in prior years. We got close to almost $30,000. Um, so with that, we try, we're trying to figure out the best me methodology and what we have are going to start going forward is bringing it every year. So every year we'll do a new ordinance for the money that we're going to bring in that year, hopefully. So then that way we don't have to bring it in multiple times during a year. So I, so your ask is based upon the haul you took in for, uh, up to a certain cutoff point. Is that, does that yes. make sense? Yes. Right. Is, is it, is, is there something that precludes us from just, uh, whatever you take in, can it just be a rolling kind of fund? And, you know, if the accountability structures are there, do you need to have to keep limiting yourself or, or specifying amount or 
is there an app is there a way we can set something up that says you know whatever we take in it is what it is and as long as you're meeting accounting standards and money's being accounted for or is there some some ordinance or statute i don't know about that requires us to do it this way (laughs) Well, we have to account for it every year that we're getting it in. And so that's sort of like why we have decided after this particular one, we'll do it every budget year. And then that way, it's just going to continue and continue roll that way. I also see the manager here, Ms. Preston. She's coming in. The, she's like the cavalry sometimes. She, she shows yes. up. Yes. She's showing up right she, now. Go ahead, Madam. Yeah, she, she, she's doing a very, very good job. But but anytime we have an ordinance, it is an estimate. And we just try not to bring too many ordinances. But uh, even if someone is giving us money or we have money, we still actually have to have the council approve a grant project ordinance in order to actually expend the funds. Gotcha. So it is, it is an estimate, but, I, but we will not, if our uh, donations are greater, uh, at some point, those donations will be included in a project ordinance so that it can be it can be expanded. Got you. And the line in the memo where it says, as of October 2020, the department has received over twelve thousand dollars in excess of the approved fifty grand. So you're asking us for twenty five grand for this year. So what 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 happens to that twelve thousand? Does that mean only thirteen from this year plus the twelve comes up to the twenty five? What, 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 yes. Where where is that twelve thousand now? So that 12,000 is currently sitting in the one that was for the 50,000. So it's actually right now received at 62,000. So we have to account for that 12,000 in order to expend it. So that's what's gonna go into this 25 now and we'll have the 13 left to through the rest of the year to receive don- donations on. Cool. And last question, all of the initiatives that, that benefit from this, uh, these donations are all you know, um, noble and, 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 and worthy um, initiatives. Th- this, this is in addition to regular line item funding that these, are, are any of these just solely funded by these charitable donations or are these charitable donations augment what these initiatives get from the regular city coffers? So some of our programs are, do not get specific line items in their budgets. Like we have the um, outreach, the Hispanic outreach liaison. The budget for that person and that position is in our general funds, but outreach activities and other things that they do are not budgeted in there. So funding for that from this program go directly to assist that person doing that. We have a historic fund that is not funded by the general fund. So trying to um, police preservation funds that goes to specifically for that. And that's not budgeted. Um, the, the LGBTQ um, re- outreach, same thing. The person is funded, but the extra activities are not aligned on their budget. So this helps with their outreach. So certain programs do have some funding and then other ones are, we have funding for the person, but not some of the extra activities. Okay. Right, that's very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate you taking the time. Interesting. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you for those questions. They, they were, I realized that they, they were very clarifying for me too. So thank you. Ms. Preston, thank you for being with us. Thank you. We're really glad to have you here today and we appreciate you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll now move to item 16. And uh, this item I pulled also This is the expansion of the fiber optic network agreement with Duke University. And I see that uh, we have Mr. Kerry Good with us. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Mayor. Um, My question is this, will all the eight communities identified be provided with a network for this amount of funding? You know, there's a list of the eight housing authority communities I couldn't tell if the, well, you know, will this amount of, what will this amount of money do? Will it only wire McDougal Terrace or will it, will it, you know, all these eight communities, will this be enough uh, to wire all of them? Yes, it, it will be enough with the exception of Liberty because Liberty is going to be tore down completely and redone. The investment would not have been a good investment in Liberty. Otherwise we're planning to put the same, 
type of service in every campus. Thank you. That's what I needed You're to very know. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you. All right, colleagues. Uh, we've now gone through all the poll items with the exception of item three. It's I'm sorry, Council Member. I'm not sure if you can see my hand. I, I'm, I'm I, sorry. I like to, Go ahead. I'd just like to follow up. Um, in addition to Liberty, I noticed that J.J. Henderson was also not included, and I just wanted to make sure to or verify that that was also already done or in a plan to be done. Uh, the campuses we identified was those with uh, students in school. Uh, so we do have last mile connectivity going to every campus. But the connectivity to the homes were prioritized to the campuses that have students in the public school system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. All right. You're welcome. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll now move to our last poll item, which is item three, and I understand that there's a presentation. Um, I know that Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, wants to make some remarks on this. And so do you want to lead us off? Happy to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this presentation is going to be from uh, two members of our Workers' Rights Commission, Antonio Luster, who's the chair, and Brian Powell, uh, one of the members of the commission. They've been working uh, for several months on putting together this Workers' Bill of Rights for us to take a look at. And as it was one of the... Um, one of the duties that we tasked the commission with when they were founded uh, it was requested by various members of the community that we create this commission and that this be one of their first tasks. So I'm really excited to bring our two um, board members to talk about their work and they've been working really hard on this for a while. And given that we don't have legislative authority to regulate a lot of the items that we know our workers rights commission is looking at and that we know that we would really like to see in our community this is written as more of an aspirational document what we uh what we believe are the rights of workers in our community and so it would be i think i um checked in with kim about what the and diana about what the actual like motion on a agenda would be like we would basically we would accept this as a resolution of the council essentially like we are signing on to this broad vision of what working people in our community deserve if that's what we decided to do moving forward um so i'm really i really like it i think it's a really excellent piece of work and happy to turn the presentation over to um antonio lester and brian powell to tell us more thanks good afternoon mr mayor um Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. Um, really quickly, I'm gonna start this presentation off and then I will turn it over to my colleague to finish. Um, if we could have the very first um, slide from the PowerPoint, please. Mr. Lester, we're seeing the first slide. Do you, you want the next one? I'm sorry, yes, the next slide, I apologize. Okay. No worries. There we go. There we go. Okay, mission. Um, the Durham Workers' Rights Commission was established in 2019, tasked in part with crafting an inspira aspirational workers' bill of rights that might help raise working conditions by serving as a guidepost for all workers and employers in the city. This document, completed and approved by the commission in November 2020, contains the ideas and principles the commission believes would benefit all workers and all those who want to work in the city of Durham and beyond. We also have a quote here from our famous humanitarian, Ella Baker, that says, people cannot be free until there's enough work in this land to give everyone a job. Next slide, please. Experience from everywhere examples, I'm sorry, experience from Durham examples from everywhere. To craft this document, the commission looked at look to experiences of Durham workers as well as the commission's own research curating information on worker protections and principles being implemented or debated in communities around the nation, including but not limited to proposed bills in the North Carolina General Assembly, HB 1140, SB 763, SB 575, as well as HB 1085, in addition to the, workers city, the New York City's Workers' Bill of Rights, 
Seattle Washington Fair Scheduling Ordinances, National Domestic Workers Alliance, Domestic, Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, New York Farm Workers Bill of Rights, Washington Fair Chance Act, proposed Federal Workplace Democracy Act, as well as proposed Federal Essential Workers Bill of Rights. Next slide, please. These are some of the bullet points contained that we're going to go into a little bit detailed. Um, so these are worker rights. Uh, all of these we're going to go, go through, uh, starting with right to a job. Next slide, please. Right to a job. Every person who wants to work deserves a job and fair wages. The city of Durham should attempt to ensure the availability of secure employment opportunities for all who want them. Next slide, please. Right to organize without retaliation. Workers have a right to join together in a range of activities related to work issues that matter to them, including whether they want to be represented by a union. Employers should not threaten, discriminate against, or otherwise act against workers for organizing or talking with coworkers about working conditions. Next slide, please. Democratic workplace. Company decision-making should be a collaborative and democratic process that prioritizes the well-being of the workforce. Workers have the right to direct, have a right to direct, to direct participation and elected representation in company decision-making. Next slide. Fair and democratic wages. Workers must be paid for every hour worked, including work before and or after scheduled shift and time spent traveling during the workday. Every worker deserves to be paid a livable wage. Every worker must be paid in a timely fashion. Every worker must be paid overtime at least one and a half times the regular rate of pay for hours above 40 hours in a single week. Workers have a right to collectively establish or negotiate wages for each position in the workplace. Next slide. Fair work week. Workers are entitled to a fair work schedule, including the following a written good faith estimate of the employee's expected duties and job description and expected work schedule prior to or upon employment. A work schedule in writing provided in a fair and timely manner prior to the, the first day of the work schedule. Compensation for work schedule changes, meaningful input into the work schedule, substantial time to rest between work shifts and from week to week, and the ability to exercise the above rights free from retaliation. I will now hand it over to my colleague, Mr. Powell, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Antonio. Um, let's take it through the rest of these. Uh, workplace free from discrimination, uh, paramount importance. Employers or job recruiters must not discriminate based on a worker or potential workers. And we've got a fairly comprehensive list we will leave here age, alienage, or citizenship status, race, ethnicity, or color, disability, or perceived disability, sex, gender, or gender identity, marital or partnership status, national origin, pregnancy, religion or creed, sexual orientation, arrest or conviction record, caregiver status, consumer credit history, unemployment status, status as a victim of domestic violence, stalking, and sex offenses, retaliation, for opposing discriminatory practices, genetics, familial status, and military status. Next slide, thank you. Uh, another very important one, workplace free from sexual violence and harassment. Workers are entitled to a workplace free from sexual assault, harassment, coercion, or any other form of sexual violence or intimidation. Workers must not be retaliated against for reporting sexual assault or harassment that they've experienced, witnessed, or were made aware of by someone experiencing or witnessing said acts. Um, this one, I want to pause for a second and, and particularly emphasize safe and healthy workplace. Okay. Every workplace must be free of known health and safety hazards. Workers have the right to receive information and training about job hazards. Workers deemed essential during unusual and dangerous circumstances are entitled to hazard pay and the option to refuse shifts without fear of retaliation. Uh, this is a particularly important and relevant um, point during this pandemic and in the wake of recent comments from the outgoing Labor Commissioner uh, Barry, who, who recently told labor advocates that the pandemic is not a workplace safety issue. 
Um, these are comments contrary to the experience of workers in, in many workplaces in North Carolina, including and disproportionately at meat processing facilities where workers are in uh, extremely close and sometimes cramped positions, uh, conditions that are required to work in low temperatures. Um, based on the News and Observer's reporting on this issue, I just want to lift up that there have been 280 clusters at workplaces in North Carolina, over 6,000 cases, at least 30 associated deaths, and over 4,000 complaints from North Carolina workers uh, regarding COVID-19 um, conditions at their workplaces uh, through October, I believe. So um, I just want to lift that issue up as one that is of particular importance in this, in this time. In the next slide. Paid, safe, and sick leave, also relevant. Workers have a right to paid, sick, and safe leave. Sick leave can be used for care and treatment for the worker or to care for anyone in the worker, anyone the worker considers family. Safe leave uh, can be used for the worker or anyone the worker considers family in order to seek help or take other safety measures for any act or threat of domestic violence, unwanted sexual contact, stalking, or human trafficking. Employers must not retaliate against workers who request to use safe and sick leave. Um, retaliation being a, a recurring theme here and um, emphasizing that it is not okay for employers to retaliate against workers expressing some of these rights. I'll go to the next one. Paid family leave. Uh, workers have a right to paid family leave. Explanatory. Fair notice of termination. Workers have a right to receive written notice of termination weeks in advance of the worker's final day. Fair administrative services. Uh, workers have a right to be provided the following in a language or method that the worker can understand. Adequate documented job training, important documents and information related to employment, pay stubs, work manuals, tax forms, that kind of thing. And uh, freelance workers have a right to a written contract if they would like one. Fair access to information about rights and remedy. Workers are entitled to be informed of their rights, federal, state, and local in a language or method the worker can understand. Additionally, methods available for pursuing remedy for violations of a worker's rights should be clear, affordable, accessible, and free from retaliation. Meaningful enforcement of laws protecting workers. Uh, departments and agents of the government tasked with enforcing existing legal protections for workers must do so in a meaningful and equitable way. Workers should be given the opportunity, the platform, and the powers necessary to advise, oversee, or investigate any agency or other regulatory body whose failure to enforce the laws has threatened or harmed the safety and well-being of workers within its jurisdiction. And that's it, I think, for this slide. What can Durham City Council do that has been addressed uh, by um, the Mayor Pro Tem? And I appreciate that. I just want to, on behalf of the commission, thank this council once again and former council member uh, Vernetta Alston, now Representative Vernetta Alston, for um, helping to, for establishing this commission and, and prioritizing worker protections and needs. Um, it's, it's appreciated for sure. And uh, we hope that the city council will agree with and adopt these principles. And I, I should say, uh, just to clarify, Again, from our perspective, what this is and what this is not, this is not a legal document. There are a lot of these principles that, um, as um, Ms. Johnson referenced earlier, are not, uh, you know, because of preemption laws, because of other laws that are already established, not something that Durham City Council could take action on right now. It's a set of guidelines and, and principles that we think are uh, something we should all be aspiring to. Thank you very much, Mr. Luster and Mr. Powell. That was a great presentation. Um, just before this meeting, uh, it, uh, I was in a, in a driving, in a, in a caravan uh, of workers uh, at McDonald's, uh, uh, the Fight for 15 organizing uh, was, was a, was a, was a drive-through caravan. And um, I was glad to be there and the so many of the things that you all have highlighted today are relevant to the lives of those employees and so many others. So thank you so much. 
Colleagues, uh, before we get started on any comments and questions you may have, I do want to say I think that I want to suggest a my in, in my uh, we can accept these, which means thank you very much. You gave them to us. We accept them, or we can also endorse them. And I want to suggest that uh, that that be our action. Um, I, I think we need to take a more you know positive. Uh, stance towards them and make it clear that we're not just receiving them, but that we, they also have our endorsement. And so I hope that we'll be thinking about that uh, as a way to move forward. All right, colleagues, questions or comments at this time? Councilmember Freeman. Thank you. I, I essentially, in the same vein, I wanted to thank you all for presenting and doing this work to pull these, um, these aspirations together. It would be really helpful to know if there was staff involved, because in addition to the endorsement, I would love to know how many of these kind of um, areas we are already doing as an employer ourselves. So it would be nice to have some type of chart or something that says this is what the city is doing already, or this is something we're aspiring to, or like th that would be in addition, in addition to an endorsement, it's like, and we are also doing these things. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Other comments, Council Member Caballero? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, the presenters today. This is excellent, all the work that the Commission did. And I also just wanted to really highlight our delegation to the General Assembly, looking at the slide that shares um, examples from other places, seeing three of our delegation having put forward um, legislation at the state level is, is really fantastic. And I just want to give a shout out. We are, we have the best delegation in the General Assembly. So uh, just wanted to acknowledge their hard work. Thank you very much, council member. Other comments? Council member Middleton. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor and welcome Brian and Antonio for uh, this great, great presentation. I see a lot of presentations in this chair, but I, I was really looking uh, forward to this one. I do want to say, I don't want to put him on the spot, but I, I do want to shout out Antonio uh, Luster. We uh, we share a connection. He, he goes to my church. And uh, when he's not a superhero uh, for workers' rights, he's also a heck of a bass player. Uh, so that, that's his cover. That's his Bruce Wayne cover uh, by day. And by night, he's fighting for workers' rights. We spend a great deal of time in another context talking about human dignity and talking about ways to, to secure that dignity and honor that dignity. So I'm incredibly proud and grateful to see him in this context, um, demonstrating that these values aren't just an academic pursuit for him. I know that they are um, bonded uh, to his belief system and to his worldview. So I just wanna thank you so much for, uh, for uh, being consistent in whatever context I see you in, my brother. Uh, and Brian, you as well, my brother, for, for this great work. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I totally echo your, your sentiments about going beyond just receiving them, but, but whatever we can do, um, however far we can go as a council with fraught waters, and, and whether that's a resolution or endorsement, whatever we can do, uh, I certainly uh, uh, support that wholeheartedly. Thank you again for this work. I want to thank um, also uh, my colleagues at Councilor uh, Alston, uh, now Representative Alston, for the Mayor Pro Tem in particular, for, for giving voice uh, and really leaning in on this issue, uh, this most important issue. So thank you all for the uh, incredible work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. We will discuss later with Mr. Luster what he thinks of your preaching. All right, okay, he gave you a thumbs up, great. <laughs> Other questions and comments, colleagues? Council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let, we'll, uh, we'll allow the conversation about uh, Pastor Middleton singing to go unsaid. Let's leave that out of the mix altogether. Um, <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, this uh, today marks, I think, the one of the one of the moments on the council when you have to look back and realize that sometimes uh, democracy works. Um, you know, the 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 Bill of Rights that came before us today um, was the result of committed residents, not elected officials, workers came together and asked the city council, please create this commission 
to set out a Bill of Rights, an aspirational document for all workers and employers in the city. Um, fill the commission with people dedicated to giving workers a fair shake in this city. And then let those, those folks do the hard work, which they have done, of researching countless other workers' bills of rights around the, st around the country, um, figuring out the right uh, things to include and not include, uh, and then bring that back to the city council. And that's, that's what today is. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. I'm emotional. I'm sorry that Representative Alston isn't here, uh, but hopefully I will send her the link uh, and maybe she can watch this part uh, because um, she did a ton of the heavy lifting uh, while she was still with us um, and will be and is and will continue to be one of our great champions in the General Assembly as we, as we endorse this resolution and then take this fight uh, to our elected leaders in Raleigh uh, to make some of these uh, ideas uh, the law of the land in North Carolina. And so I just want to thank uh, the members of the commission, especially Brian and Antonio, for coming today. Um, it's not easy to uh, speak before the city council, especially in this fraught era of COVID when we're all virtual and you got to get all the connections right. And I'm just really grateful for you all for taking time to do it in the middle of a work day uh, and for all the work that went into this. It's um, I'm a little choked up. It's a little inspirational, Mr. Mayor, uh, to see uh, an idea that came to us uh, from ordinary folks uh, come through the often tortuous and mangling legislative process to get to this point today. Um, and so I just want to thank everybody involved and uh, say this gives me a little bit more hope uh, for who we are as a community. So, and obviously I agree we should endorse it. Say that. Thank, okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Council. Thank you, Council Member. And I see our manager, Madam Manager. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, what I would like to say on behalf of the administration, obviously the city of Durham is only one employer uh, in Durham, but we can be a leader. And we do hear uh, the, the information that has been presented to the council today and want to uh, are ready to measure our own organization uh, against those, um, those values. So thank you for your work. Thank you so much, Madam Manager. Uh, that's great and much appreciated. The one, um, th there was one concept in here that was new to me and that was safely. And uh, I really appreciated learning about that. And I hope that's something that uh, we can think about as well as, a, as a, for the city. Any other comments? All right, I really wanna thank you again, Mr. Luster and Mr. Powell for being with us. I think the way that we should uh, proceed um, is to, um, Colleagues, I'm going to suggest that we, at our Monday night, that we put this on our agenda for our Monday night meeting coming up with a motion to endorse this uh, Workers' Bill of Rights at that time uh, and to, uh, in, in line with what the manager said, and to ask uh, our city administration to review our policies in light of these, in light of these principles. Would you all find that acceptable? Can I see some thumbs? Okay, great. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, would you mind writing that motion and, and sort of and getting with the clerk and uh, making sure that she has that for in time for the next uh, in time for our Monday night meeting on the 21st? Sure. Yes, happy to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you again, um, Brian and Antonio for coming. Really appreciate it. And uh, it's been great working with y'all over the last uh, few months and excited to keep working with you on the commission and continue to um, help improve the lives of, of working people in Durham. So thank you. And Madam Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for your work on this and your, your uh, support for the group. All right, thank you all very much. Um, and now we'll move on to, we have two presentations. Um, both of them transportation related. And the first of those is item 17, the, the commuter rail uh, study update. And I see uh, Sean Egan with us. Mr. Egan, welcome, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and, and members of the city council. So I'd like to move right into the presentation we have with us, Jay Hykus, Senior Transportation Planner for Go Triangle to provide a presentation on the Greater Triangle Commuter Rail Project. 
So I'll hand it off to Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Jay Heikus, Senior Transportation Planner with Go Triangle. Um, last time, I'm here to provide an update on the feasibility study for the commuter rail, um, Greater Triangle Commuter Rail. I believe the Council last heard an update earlier this fall. Um, since then, work has gotten underway across a number of tasks. Um, I'd like to highlight a few updates for this Council. Next slide, please. Um, first thing I wanted to highlight is that the commuter rail is a part of a larger set of regional transit investments um, that are envisioned across a number of plans. Um, one of those plans that um, this council is very aware of and you'll hear more on from um, the transit plan team um, is the update to the Durham County Transit Plan. A goal of this feasibility study is to provide um, more, more refinement and more detail on the concept of a commuter rail um, that can then be evaluated as part of the transit plan update process. Um, and those things are ongoing concurrently and in coordination. Next slide. This slide zooms in a little bit, or this slide focuses on the commuter rail corridor. Um, it starts in West Durham near Duke and VA Medical Centers, continues with proposed stations in downtown Durham, East Durham and Ellis Road. Um, and connects Durham residents to job centers such as Research Triangle Park, um, Cary and Northwest Wake, and Raleigh. And the rail line continues out to East Gardner with the potential um, for some service to be extended to Clayton and Johnston County. A goal of this, or primary outcome of this phase of study is developing a project concept. Um, that project concept includes, um, includes the track infrastructure, um, the rails, the number of trains, their schedule, as well as defining the station locations. Um, so that's when we say project concept, that's what we mean by that. Um, and reaching, um, next slide please. So that's the outcome of the study. The primary goal and during this phase of study is to reach a regional consensus um, among stakeholders, including the city council, on the contents of that project concept, as well as the um, as well as consensus on whether or not to move forward um, with that project concept and to move it towards design as well as constructing it. Um, to reach that goal of achieving consensus, um, there are three primary elements to this study. Um, the first is engaging the community. There are three engagement sessions. There are three engagement efforts um, that will be conducted as part of the study. And I have an update on the first one um, later in this slide deck. Um, the next one is working with the railroad owner, North Carolina Railroad, as well as the operators to determine and reach agreement on the types of infrastructure and improvements um, that are required to support additional train traffic. Um, also related to that is reaching agreement on the railroad with liability, indemnity, and other key aspects of reaching agreement with the railroads. And then also the study will do some analysis um, about the challenges of the project as well as potential project benefits. Um, one of those challenges that this council is very familiar with is that of downtown Durham, and I have an update on that as well. Next slide, please. In order to achieve this goal of reaching consensus, we're working with municipalities across um, along the line, as well as the counties, metropolitan planning organizations, railroads, NCDOT, um, and other stakeholders. Um, this slide is specific to our efforts with the city of Durham. Um, in coordination with the transit plan update, we are also providing quarterly updates to the city council on the commuter rail project. That update also goes to the county commissioners as well as the metropolitan planning organization. Um, we are meeting monthly um, or on an as needed basis with city of Durham staff to discuss issues that are specific to Durham. Um, we also have a monthly um, municipal and institution stakeholder group um, that meets to be updated on the study. Um, and there are a number of um, organizations that are based in Durham that take part in that um, group. And then finally, there are also task specific meetings um, that also include um, the city as well as other stakeholders in Durham, including the universities um, and the Chamber of Commerce. Next slide, please. As alluded to, um, we're working on um, doing some engineering analysis um, among for the challenges that exist to adding rail traffic to downtown Durham, 
Um, those include environmental screening, um, developing a menu of concepts that include track design, station siting, um, roadway and traffic adjustments, as well as utilities. And then as part of that, as noted on the previous slide, there's stakeholder and community engagement. Um, this is work that is um, ongoing. Um, we've met with that um, technical stakeholder group that includes city staff um, a couple of times. Um, survey work has been completed um, along this quarter, and now engineering work is underway. And we'll have more to share um, in the coming months with stakeholders, the community, um, and the city um, as those concepts um, receive that engineering analysis. Next slide. And the last thing I wanted to update the council on um, is our engagement effort. We've completed our first round of public engagement. We've received responses from more than 2,700 individuals. It's my understanding that 600 of those response, 600 of those individuals are from Durham-based zip codes. Um, and this was also done in coordination with the first phase of engagement of the Durham Transit Plan. Um, so folks who took the commuter rail survey um, were then directed to the transit plan to also provide in, input into that, and I believe vice versa. Um, this was due to COVID, this was primarily an online effort. Um, we're well aware that online surveys, um, especially in times of COVID, um, do not produce results um, that, are, um, that are representative of the community and particularly um, disadvantaged communities um, that exist along the corridor. Um, to do that, um, we've partnered or we've taken a few efforts um, and we're very optimistic um, to receive more feedback about commuter rail as part of the Durham Transit Plan update. Um, some of the efforts that were taken specific to commuter rail, including um, email campaigns, um, which included targeted emails to residents across um, BIPOC communities in the study area. Um, there were also um, in Durham and in coordination with the Durham Transit Plan update, um, there were in-person um, events at, and these were COVID appropriate with masks, um, and folks who completed the survey got um, hand sanitizer, uh, but in-person events um, at Durham Station, the Regional Transit Center, as well as the Village, which is another high ridership destination in the Durham community. Uh, we've also partnered um, with community organizations in the region that are providing essential services. Um, a good example of that in Durham is Meals on Wheels of Durham, um, where their volunteers were able to either conduct in-person or phone surveys um, that were then entered into the online database. And then also um, for groups that were, for community groups that Go Triangle is connected with um, that are meeting online, we were able to attend and present at virtual um, community group meetings. I also, not on this slide, but something that I really, that I think is really important to mention is, is that um, this effort is being coordinated with the Durham Transit Plan update and specifically um, the survey, which you'll hear more about in the next slide, um, asked questions um, that help, will help us understand uh, more about the commuter rail project and the public's um, insight into that project and their opinions. Um, specifically, um, there are questions that related to um, folks' um, travel needs, whether they be regional or local, um, what types of destinations they would like to get to um, using transit, um, and what types of destinations they go to now, as well as even specific questions about the types of investment um, and different transit technologies. Um, that is, um, I don't want to steal their thunder, but we're also, we're excited to um, receive some, um, receive insight from the Engagement Ambassador Program um, that can then be used and brought into this commuter rail engagement effort. Uh, I do want to mention as well um, that this survey was, or this engagement effort was aimed at informing as well as gauging the public's um, level of support um, with the commuter rail or level of familiarity as well as their perceptions of the commuter rail project. Um, because of that, um, the survey consisted of four open-ended questions, um, which we are actively working to categorize. And at our next update, um, our next quarterly update, we will provide more information um, on those survey responses. Um, something um, council member Reese mentioned yesterday at the MPO, which I wanted to highlight is, um, a lot of times when you ask folks, they don't understand what commuter rail is. We really did try to um, provide some information. We have a long way to go with that. Um, but also the second piece of that is we do hear a lot, um, and I suspect in the survey, we hear a lot about other transit needs and transportation needs that people have. 
And those will be passed along to the Durham Transit Plan um, as we categorize these responses. All right, next slide. With that, I'm happy to take any um, questions or comments from the council. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Heikus. We appreciate your being with us today. And thank you for that presentation. I'm gonna ask now if there are any questions uh, or comments by members of the council. Council Member Freeman. Thank you, I appreciate the presentation and all of the information. I'm, I'm excited, I was excited to hear about the uh, Engagement Ambassador Program. I, um, I had the opportunity of working with Go Triangle a long time ago to develop a, a, some, a such a program. Um, I just have one question regarding, uh, I guess the way funding is occurring with the NCDOT and just acknowledging that along this corridor there's a number of projects. Is that gonna have any impact on how this rolls out and has that been, I guess, factored into this conversation around funding? So yes, um, to answer the question about NCDOT projects that may affect this project, um, we are keeping track of those and understanding their timelines. Um, specifically, there's um, the, some grade separation projects within Durham County um, that are moving forward on a different timeline. Um, but for the project itself, um, the funding assumption right now is, is that there would not be state funding. Um, so this is 50% assumed right now is a 50% federal match and then 50% local match. Um, that's something that we will continue to pursue state funds for, um, but right now um, that assumption of the state match is not included. Okay. And then just to, just acknowledging, is there a chart? Cause I didn't, I, I, I know in this report it's, it's a very simple report. Is there a chart that is tracking which projects are connected to this? I'm not aware of one off the top of my mind, but that is something we can prepare and respond to the council if that's of interest. And then just noting like it's it's helpful when having conversations with our division rep with DOT if I need to put more pressure on these specific projects moving ahead as priorities versus others. Um, just just a note for myself. I'm not sure if others are interested, but I, I, if there's a specific resource, I, I, I'm fine being directed to it. You don't have to create it. Uh, I think you raise a good point, council member, and that's something that if we don't have, it might be very useful to have. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, council member. Council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hi, Jay, good to see you again. It's been so long. Um, Jay gave a version of this presentation at the NPO meeting yesterday and was glad to have him there then and glad to see you again today. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I, uh, Jay, the, um, the slide about community engagement indicates that um, in-person events were focused on outreach to current transit riders. Um, does that mean current Go Triangle transit riders or current Go Durham transit riders or both? Both. Um, the, the events were specifically at the Regional Transit Center, which is primarily Go Triangle, and then also at Durham Station as well as the Village, um, which are primarily um, Go Durham riders. Great. That's great to hear. Um, Mr. Mayor did have a couple of comments if this is the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, some of my colleagues have heard this spiel before, uh, as recently as a, a, about a day and a half ago. Uh, some of you haven't heard it for a while, and some of you may never have heard it. So um, if you need to go do something else for a couple minutes, that's fine. Um, Mr. Mayor, I believe that commuter rail uh, can bring benefits to Durham. Uh, and I think um, that at the right price, uh, Durham should participate in the project. And I look forward, that's why I've supported uh, the ongoing planning efforts uh, and will continue to support efforts to kind of get us up to a decision about whether or not to move forward with the project overall um, in my role as a member of uh, the MPO board, um, which frankly is the only way I have input because the city of Durham doesn't really uh, get a vote on commuter rail. Uh, the city council doesn't. Uh, but I would like to point out to my colleagues, you know, I recently uh, provided each of my colleagues uh, a very short book uh, called, um, that um, talks about um, the importance of local transit in improving the lives of the people who live in cities. And um, 
I hope that over time, as we all read that book, we will understand what I've come to believe um, at some flavor of intensity, depending on your own policy preferences, colleagues, which is that um, public transportation in the city of Durham is critically important uh, to the lives of our residents and making our public transportation better, uh, more bus shelters, more frequent service, um, uh, more efficient bus routes, uh, cross town routes, uh, all the things that we can do um, will uh, improve the lives of the people of the city uh, in a bunch of ways, large and small. Um, and in an era of limited dollars, uh, projects like commuter rail, um, by their nature, uh, compete with those kinds of local transit projects in terms of prioritization for funding, especially through the Durham County Transit Plan and the funds that are collected through the, through the transit tax increment uh, every year and the sales tax. Um, all of which is to say that, as I said at the beginning, I think commuter rail can re have real benefits for the city of Durham, and that's why I've supported uh, the planning efforts so far. Uh, but uh, I, I think it only makes sense for us if the price is right for Durham. Um, and that is a vigorous conversation that's been going on for a while and will continue to go on uh, between uh, Wake County and Durham County. Uh, and I hope that each of us uh, will uh, be engaged in that process as those, as those conversations uh, unfold and that we will uh, make it clear uh, our perspective about what we think that fair price ought to look like. Um, and uh, because every dollar that goes to commuter rail is a dollar that we can't spend doing other things. And, um, and I think there is a price where that balance works out. Uh, and there is a price beyond which that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think the other thing that it's important to remember is that um, our Go Durham bus riders, 80% uh, of them are people of color, 75% of them have incomes less than $25,000 a year, and two thirds of them are, are live in zero car households. Uh, and for those folks, Go Durham is an absolute lifeline to everything they need to get around the city uh, for work, uh, for recreation, for shopping, for all the things they need to do. Um, and so as we go through this, it'll be important to look at the communities that are served by our local bus service um, and the communities uh, and types of folks that will be served uh, by a prospective commuter rail project. Having said all that, a very wise person uh, within the last couple of days reminded me that when the uh, transit referendum passed in 2011, the primary thrust of that uh, advocacy effort uh, that the people of Durham overwhelmingly supported was not necessarily for the support of local uh, bus service, although that's certainly a permissible use. The big selling point was the possibility of funding large regional projects that would connect uh, different parts of the triangle uh, with, uh, with more robust uh, regional transit options. And so, um, so I think that's sort of on the other side of the question is we might decide as, a, as individual uh, public policymakers that we'd rather spend all the money on local bus service. But the fact is, you know, local governments went to the, the Durham County went to the voters and said, these are the things we were going to do. And large regional transit projects were on that list. Uh, so I think it's a complicated balance. I don't envy our friends uh, at the county for having to engage in that conversation with Wake County. Uh, but I just want to make sure that all of us are, are keenly aware that the conversation is happening right now. Um, and the success of transit in Durham, both local and regional, will, I think, in large part depend on the outcome of those negotiations. So I just wanted to make put out a plea to my colleagues to be engaged in that process to the extent we can, to try to get as much information as you can about it, and to make sure that Durham gets the best deal possible. Um, but with that, I will let other folks talk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Awesome speech. Okay. Um, questions or comments? Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Council Reese. I wanted to stay for every minute of the speech because like a great jazz performance, it's different every time. Um, so I appreciate that. And I want to associate myself uh, with your comments. But, um, and I, I got my copy of Better Buses, Better Cities, and I've added it into rotation. About the four or five other things I'm trying to read simultaneously. So thank you for that, uh, Councilor Reese. Um, I, in your community engagement, the, the you you not you particularly, but but it it it, it makes a point of of stating that BIPOC communities were reached out to. Um, I'm curious as to what is the selling point. What, what what do you what is being said to those communities 
that um, is supposed to be compelling about commuter rail. I remember, you know, during the, the light rail um, initiative, it, it, it was supposed to connect um, people that had historically been excised out of the economic participation because of what happened with 147, uh, a reconnecting and, and a reestablishing of, of opportunity and carrying people to jobs, uh, job centers. Are those, so in community engagement, when you engage these communities, these BIPOC communities, what do we say to them? What's the selling point for commuter rail to them? I think that's an excellent question. Um, this first phase of study um, is really focused on the feasibility and viability of the project. Um, and the first phase of engagement in particular was more focused on um, informing what is a commuter rail, what type of service does it provide, um, when would it, when could it reasonably be expected to run? Um, how is it different from other types of transit? Um, and then they were asked a series of open-ended questions um, and what, what they thought of that. Um, as we continue to work through this study, um, we are doing some analysis of the communities um, and areas where job access might be increased, um, people potential to connect in the local bus to commuter rail service to better understand um, those types of benefits, um, as well as things um, that may be an impact like additional noise or vibration um, or additional um, traffic impacts because the gates are down more because there's more trains. Um, so at this point in time, we're not, I wouldn't say we're trying to sell the project um, or sell it to any one community in particular. We're really trying to inform Part of that um, and part of the engagement is understanding what's important to people so that we can then respond in additional phases of engagement. Um, one of the questions, um, and I'm quite proud of our public engagement team for um, putting words to this, is if you could tell um, what do you want elected officials to know before they make a decision on this project. So I'm hoping that we will get, um, we'll have some good feedback from that and understand um, what is important um, to communities um, across the region. No, and, and, no, I, I, I appreciate that uh, uh, deeply. And, um, and I appreciate the, the clarification that not necessarily trying to sell anything. I guess my, there, some of us have been hurt before, uh, historically, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, transportation projects. So, so I just want to channel some of that, that angst. Um, I, and I understand that we're not selling yet, but the fact that we, indicated that we were making a, a targeted effort to contact BIPOC communities, to me has import. There's a reason, we didn't say we're just telling everybody the information, there's a reason why uh, we brought up those communities. Um, and, and in addition to not, uh, or I should say beside, not just trying to sell it to them, I mean, for those of us that are gonna advocate for this kind of stuff, we, I think we have to be able to say it's gonna do no harm either uh, in terms of disrupting uh, um, communities, um, you know, land, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously deep concern about gentrification. So, so even if we're not at the selling point, I guess I'm just looking for the, the do no harm talk as well, that, that it, it will not make you worse off, uh, if we can't talk about what will make you better yet. So I just hope that those kind of things will be kept, uh, in mind. And the on-ramp again, for me, is the fact that we BIPOCs in this, in this presentation, which suggests to me that there's, there's, you know, this isn't just window dressing. We're reaching out to these communities for uh, specific reasons, um, historical and, and, and otherwise. Um, but I appreciate it. I do have one other question. The map where the star indicating the RDU connector, is, is that just like that red line between RDU and Morrisville? Is that the future? Because I, mean, I, I don't see a star, per se. I didn't, at least on my map. So the star where it says future RDU connector, is that that red line between Morrisville and RDU? That is, and I apologize, that's a typographical error we're in the process of fixing on that map that there should not be an asterisk there anymore. Oh, okay. The, but to, I think get at maybe what your question, to the question of the connection between RDUs, there would be a shuttle bus between the nearest station um, and the airport, um, very similar to Baltimore Washington Airport um, Boston Airport, depending on where you're going, I'm going to know it across the country. I've been frustrated at both of those locations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member.
Other comments or questions at this time, colleagues? Councilmember Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, appreciate um, Councilmember Reese's commentary. I, I, um, it brings to mind, and I'm making sure that I do mention from, from um, that standpoint, it, it, feels, it feels overwhelming to think about how much it, it could cost um, in, in reference to if we don't move forward with um, regional transportation planning in a way that's impactful, acknowledging um, all of the kind of climate climate changing issues. And I just wanna just circle back around and include the conversation needs to be held at, um, at the federal level as well, acknowledging that uh, you know our FAST Act funding almost expired um, in a very political battle. Uh, we have to come up with these bipartisan kind of, con con or this bipartisan uh, support that makes sure that we have federal funding because this could be a situation where it's 80-20 as opposed to 50-50 and that could help alleviate a lot of the pressure that we're feeling in making the decision here locally because we do know we need buses as well as the transit. And so, I, I, I mean, I think I, I just wanna make sure that I put in perspective that Georgia is gonna matter and it, just acknowledging that if we don't get it right, uh, you know, we have a new uh, leadership going into office uh, God willing, um, but we've got to stay vigilant about how we make sure this shows up federally because the fight is not just here locally. And so I know it breaks out into smaller issues with Wake and you know and Orange and who gets the funds and how the funds are used. And if we don't, if we don't avoid looking at ourselves and trying to take from ourselves and, and kind of redirect to kind of unify and push on the federal level because we do have two senators who are sitting there and they need to respond. They need to act on our behalf as a state and acknowledge that we need this regional transit and uh, the difference makers are there. And so I know our chair of the transportation committee has been on board with making the adjustments that are necessary so we're not doing these last minute resolutions, but uh, we need our, our, our federal senators, Senator Byrne and Senator Tillis to step up. So I just wanted to make sure that we didn't leave them out of that push. Thank you. Amen. All right, any other questions or comments? Um, I, had, I do have a couple of uh, questions you mentioned the possibility of state funding uh, for the CRT, for the commuter rail, and we know that this, so far, the plan has not included that. That would be a game changer. Um, and so, uh, and of course, the light rail, uh, you know, even after being batted around and, you know, ha have been, been actually pretty much zeroed out, uh, by the end of the light rail process, we did have an amount of funding for the light rail, which would, again, be game changing for the commuter rail. And so I'm wondering, is the study, um, is the study analyzing or is there any analysis going on about the project's ability to get funding through the spot process? I would say in this particular study, um, the answer is no. Um, it is this project and variations of this project were submitted both by the DCHC MPO as well as the capital area metropolitan planning organization um, in an attempt to um, score this through the um, current round of spot prioritization that's ongoing. Um, we know that there's not a lot of money in spot for transit to begin with and um, we also know that there's not a lot of money for spot um, right now. Um, I think the other piece of it too um, comes to some of the um, policy work that um, Campo and DCHC MPO are jointly taking on um, and trying to develop a strategy and an approach um, on some of these larger regional projects of asking for partnership and participation from the state uh, when there is such a significant local match on a project. Um, but those are, those are primarily by the MPOs. So that would be outside of the spot process, that second thing that you said? I believe it would have to be. Yeah. Uh, and so um, what, is the, what is the date that we are working towards or some range of dates 
to submit into the federal process where we'd have to have the financial plan uh, totally in, in place. So the, the goal at the end of this phase of study, which is um, 12 to 18 months from when it started earlier this summer, um, could extend as, as far as 24 months um, based on the memorandum of understanding. Um, the goal is to have that cost share settled at the end of this study. Um, so that time, time frame would be um, end of 2021, beginning of 2022, first half of 2022. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think this through a little bit in terms of the, the, the relevant timing with the spot, with the spot process. I, I understand exactly, you know, good point. There's, there's no money there now. Um, but that could change as we come out of the out of this COVID-driven recession. Um, okay. Um, well, I hope that that will be. I know that you all will be thinking about that, and I'm glad that you're getting it scored. I didn't know that, and that's good to hear. Um, in the the fifty percent federal share assumption, is that still a reasonable assumption? That is the assumption we are working off of. Um, we are, um, as, as part of um, this study, both uh, one of the key pieces is assessing risks, um, whether they be engineering challenges, um, whether they be um, cost challenges, um, and whether they be um, FTA eligibility risks. Um, and that's something that we are continuing to evaluate. But right now, we do believe that 50% is um, what we would want to put into that cost share um, at, at the appropriate time. Um, if, yeah, I guess, um, you know, with the light rail, we, 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 we worried that it was going to drop below the 50. Uh, but of course, we got a different administration there now. And that was really an, a decision that was driven by, by federal administrators rather than by Congress. And so I think that that's thinking that through a little bit, that's probably a reasonable assumption. And the, um, just, to, just to say that the, the, the issues that were there with the light rail, uh, not the issue with Duke so much, but with Irwin Road, but the issues with indemnification, the issue with the, and, and, and uh, the issue with the, how to get through downtown Durham in a way that is good for our city um, still remain. And I know you all are going to be working hard on those, uh, but I continue to, to, to want to push for, getting those resolved early. Um, you know, we can't be where we were with the light rail at the end of the process trying to solve these difficult problems. So I'm gonna say that every time um, I'm saying it to you now. I say it at Go Triangle all the time. So um, just wanna emphasize that. All right, any other questions or comments for Mr. Heikis? I'll have some more general comments about the commuter rail uh, in our next, uh, in our next um, in our next item, but I really appreciate your being here, sir. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you and keep it going. And uh, we're looking forward to, to your, your updates as the study moves forward. Thank you so much. Mr. Egan, do you have the next uh, item to introduce? Yes, I'd like to introduce uh, Aaron Kane, who's the transportation planning manager for the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, and Aaron has some team members uh, for his presentation on the update to the Durham County Transit Plan. So go ahead, Aaron. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam Pro Tem, uh, members of the council. I'll uh, start off by introducing the team members that I have with me to make this presentation on an update to the Durham County Transit Plan. Along with me, uh, we have Brooke uh, Ganser from the Durham City County Planning Department. She'll be talking primarily about our outreach efforts. I also have Ideal Ortiz from Idealism, who's been heading up our Engagement Ambassadors Program. She'll be talking about that. Um, I'll be talking about the technical analysis, but I also have two other people here in case you have specific questions. Mary-Kate Marukian from our consultant, Kim Lee Horn, as well as Praveen Sridharan from Go Triangle, who uh, is with Go Triangle Finance and can answer finance questions if you have them. With that, I'd like to you to ask, ask you to go ahead and put up the presentation, please. There we go. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Brooke to talk about our outreach efforts. 
Uh, thank you, Erin. Uh, yeah, I'm going to now provide a brief update about our team's outreach efforts for this phase of engagement. So this phase of outreach has specifically focused <laughs> on confirming what we heard from community members during the listening and learning workshops, the online surveys, and engagement ambassador sessions, which occurred last fall and winter. During this phase of engagement, our team has sought community input through the promotion of an online survey, virtual stakeholder meetings, in-person tabling events at the Durham Station, the Regional Transit Center, along with the Village. And we have also been utilizing engagement ambassadors, which Ideal will touch on in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. So here is a very high level summary of our online survey results as of November 30th. So when the survey information was first pulled, um, there were about 600 completed surveys. Respondents, as you can see, tended to be wealthier and wider community, community residents. For some quick highlights, there were about 57% of residents saying that travel within Durham is the most important. Additionally, frequency, coverage, and more direct service are most important for convenience, while improving stops and adding sidewalk, sidewalks and crosswalks are most important to improve access. We extended the closing date for the survey until mid-December and are currently entering our in-person surveys that were completed during our in-person tabling events. So we are expecting these final survey results to vary slightly from what you see here. Next slide, please. So additionally, our team has also conducted numerous stakeholder interviews with various groups, including the Human Relations Commission, the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission, Durham Chamber of Commerce, Durham Tech, NCCU, Duke, along with others. Um, and during these meetings, our team provided an update on the plan along with the comprehensive plan and asked some guiding discussion questions. Uh, these questions were similar to those asked in the survey. And notes from these discussions along with the online and in-person surveys will be analyzed and used in finalizing the plan's objectives and the transit plan scenarios. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ideal now, who's gonna provide a, an update on our engagement ambassador program. And next slide, please. Yeah. Hey everybody, my name is Ideal Ortiz and um, we have recruited over 45 community residents who all come from a variety of underrepresented communities. Um, some of them are listed here, but of course, we also reached out to people with disabilities and people who live in the northern part of our city as well, since we know, um, or of the county, I should say, since we know those are areas that have a harder time being represented in survey data. Um, as Brooke told you earlier, um, the overall um, online survey, um, it shared, they shared some demographics about um, who answered there. But I did, for those of you who weren't at the MPO meeting earlier this week, I did want to repeat um, some preliminary statistics, even though the community um, residents who are a part of our engagement ambassador um, effort are still actually collecting data. And so this particular phase of data collection will continue on until December 18th. Um, a little bit about the folks who are um, currently, uh, of the responses we have collected, 70% of those who responded make less than $50,000 a year. 73% of those folks have direct first person experience with riding Go Durham or Go Triangle buses. 78% of the survey responses are people of color. And there may be more, but some folks chose to not respond to that question. And 62% of those who chose to respond to this demographic question are renters here in the city of Durham. And so that just gives you a snapshot of the difference of what happens when we do engage 
local people who have direct access to networks of people who represent a part of Durham that often faces various historical and institutional barriers. And so we just wanted to bring that to light to you. We are compensating those ambassadors and we have impressed upon them during orientation uh, the things that they need to know. Um, and Mr. Mayor will appreciate this around the COVID-19 safety. And so as we get word from our governor and of course from our mayor and our city and our public health officials, we do during orientation mention that. And so we created materials that would allow folks to be in connection with their community to get these survey responses in ways that are safe um, and that can be socially distanced. So these are tools that are nimble and allow them to do things online. We provide support for them and access to Zoom, training for Facebook Rooms, training for Google Meet, any resource that they feel comfortable using so that they can meet with folks virtually and get this information out to everybody without putting themselves or their network of contacts at risk. Um, more, so um, in the orientation sessions, people had really great questions and to uh, the earlier question about what are we, how do we sell people on this involvement? Well, we know that the transit plan as well as the comprehensive plan is going to impact Durham. And so we simply sell to them that this is a way for them to be at the table before the plans are baked and before the plans have been set and that we want a Durham that responds to the needs of everyone and not just the most privileged. And they have been very excited to be a part of this effort with us. Next week, we will be having a, um, even though it'll be two days shy of the deadline for survey responses, we will be having on December 16th an opportunity to celebrate all the hard work. So we'll be hosting a virtual meeting with our um, currently recruited engagement ambassadors to tell them, thank you so much for all the hard work you've already done. Here's a snapshot of the analysis of the data, just a quick sort of summary of what has been collected and what has been said as a way to be transparent with the data that has already come in and um, give them an opportunity to tell us what about this process might need to shift? What do they like about it? As we know that we will have future iterations of this as well. And we also wanna make sure that if there are people in the community interested in being an engagement ambassador for future rounds, that this is an, uh, that meeting next week will also be an opportunity for them to um, learn more about being an engagement ambassador to see if it's right for them in the future in 2021. And that's all I've got. And I'll turn it back over to Brooke or Erin. Oh, I actually can say more about this. So the screening, um, we did not just pick random folks. Um, the questions on the recruitment form were specifically um, meant to let us know whether these are folks who already have a network of people that they are in contact with. So if you are the person in your neighborhood who everyone comes to because you've got the food boxes or you know the resources for people's children or you seem to always know what number you should call for the right city service, um, we felt like that made you a pretty reliable person. And so the question specifically on the recruitment form was, do you already have a network of people that you are in community with or convene that are a part of one of those identified communities that comes from a traditionally underrepresented background. And so when people indicated yes to that, we considered them as qualified. And so um, then we provided some orientation sessions online. There was one orientation session provided completely in Spanish and all of the materials um, have been translated into Spanish as well. And now I'll turn it over. Thank you, Ideal. So I'll go through, I'm gonna go briefly through the technical analysis that was, is currently underway. Um, and just be aware that as I'm going through these maps, these are illustrative. These are maps that, we're, that are, are in progress that we are working on, but we just wanna give you a sense as to the kind of things that we're looking at as uh, we're moving forward with the analysis and getting ready for the scenarios that we're gonna develop that I'll talk about in a little bit. Next slide, please. So one of the first things we're doing is looking at all of the planning that's been done already. Those of you who've uh, either are or have been on the MPO board, you're used to our acronyms like CTP, MTP, TIP. But we're looking at a range of planning and transportation that's already been done for the city and the county. 
and a number of projects that have already been identified, not just transit, but uh, bike ped projects, multimodal projects, rail projects, anything that can be what we call transit supportive, even roadway projects, where we might be say widening a road that can be used for a future BRT or express bus service. So we're looking at that entire universe of projects um, and we're gonna use that as part of our gaps analysis. Next slide. Um, in addition to creating that universe of projects, we're also coordinating with other plans that are going on. Many of you are probably aware that uh, the Orange County Transit Plan is also being updated at this time, so we're working with them. We're also working with Wake County as they update their transit uh, vision and extend it out for another three years. So we wanna make sure that we're coordinated with both of those counties since we do have important capital projects and operating projects that will cross the county lines. In addition to that, you heard from Jay on CRT, so we're coordinating there. Uh, we did some joint uh, public outreach with that and we'll be coordinating with them to make sure that we have uh, all the up-to-date and most recent information on the CRT study so we can incorporate it into our plan. We're also doing a lot of work with a comprehensive plan. Uh, we've been in coordination with the planning department for months now and the outreach and work that they are doing, one of the more important, well, one of the important facets of the comprehensive plan as they look to update that has been transportation. They've been hearing a lot about that and we wanna make sure that all of the commentary they're hearing from the public on the comprehensive plan is also incorporated into our efforts. Next slide, please. So on the technical side, one of the things we're looking at is transit propensity. What is the likelihood that a certain area of our community is going to be more likely to use transit or not use transit? So we're looking at things like um, residential density, uh, employment density, and then we're also overlaying that with our environmental justice communities that were identified through the MPOs process and adopted earlier this summer. So we're marrying that with things like uh, identified affordable housing, be it market rate or be it legally binding, as well as high ridership stops. And we'll use this uh, as a gauge of demand and a gauge of areas that um, will likely need improved transit services in the future. Next slide, please. Another thing we're looking at are the level of amenities at our bus stops. That is something we have heard for quite a while now is a need to improve our bus stops, working with Go Triangle and Go Durham. They've been doing a fantastic job of getting uh, a number of our bus stops improved with benches, shelters, lighting, et cetera. We know there's a lot more work to do and we wanna make sure that improving our level of amenities, such as I just mentioned, but also making sure that they are ADA compliant is a major part of this plan. Next phase, next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, ADA compliance, we wanna make sure that our stops are accessible. Just putting a stop in where there is no sidewalk, where it's not easy for people to get to, where there's not a landing pad, so it's easy, easy to actually get on the bus once you're at the stop. We wanna make sure all of those things are also in place, and that will also be a major uh, part of this uh, plan going forward. Next slide, please. So we'll take our transit propensity map, look at where our current services are, the additional data analysis that we're doing, and put that all into a needs assessment. Where does it look like we need to be, what areas of the community and what kinds of service are they going to need? We'll marry that with our universe of projects maps. What, have we, what projects have we already identified? And that'll help us figure out what the gaps are that we need to fill in through this planning process. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk a bit about uh, finances and just to make sure that everybody's aware that as we're doing this plan, this, this plan will be fiscally constrained. We are looking at what our future revenues are with the, tra with the sales tax and the other fees that we have in place for revenues for the transit tax fund. And we're making sure that any proposed improvements, proposed projects are in line with our projected revenues. So you can see this quick graph of how we expect to, uh, our projections for revenues in the future through 2040, which is about the life of this plan. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. 
and comparing that with our committed capital expenditures. And you can see for the first couple of years, we have pretty much already identified how we're gonna spend our funding in, in this year, next year, and quite a bit in fiscal year 23. This is only capital expenditures, expenditures. this is not operating expenditures, which tend to be about one third, uh, take up about one third of our revenues every year. Oh, please, please go back to where I was. Nope. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, but in outline years, FY24 and beyond, uh, we do have some available capacity in our revenue projections to be able to uh, create more new operating projects, new capital projects, and that's where we see the plan really be able to start take effect. Next slide, please. So finally, on next steps, we'll complete that needs and gaps, and gaps analysis. Um, we're combining that with our outreach results. We actually have our first uh, scenario development meeting next Thursday with staff. Uh, we have three scenario developments set up uh, between now and the first week of February. And we look to be able to come out with public, publicly with uh, three scenarios for people to weigh in on in, during the month of February. Next slide, please. So where we are right now, we, we've, we're wrapping up the existing conditions, putting the final touches on that. As I mentioned, next week we'll be meeting to discuss scenarios. Uh, we'll do that scenario transit planning through the winter, come out in February with um, for public comment on that and scenario evaluation. We'll then take those comments back based on the three scenarios that are put out, come up with a final scenario that we'll be able to put in, we think about May, and then once uh, we have public comment from that, hopefully by early next fall, late summer, we're coming to you for your official comments and endorsement. And with that, I'd like to turn it over if there are any questions or comments. Thank you very much to all of you all for that presentation. It was excellent. And uh, I'll now open it up to questions and comments by my colleagues. Councilmember Freeman. Thank you. I, um, just a brief comment of thanks. I know um, Aaron has worked hard on, on this project for a while. And I can only imagine in the midst of COVID how difficult it's been. I really appreciate the engagement work on this and uh, the attention to accessibility, acknowledging that these are the things we've been talking about for the last number of years. and. I can see that, you know, I guess the the kind of, uh, I want to say the equitable engagement planning has has been really um, incorporated into this process. And I just wanted to say thank you. I also wanted to thank um, Miss Ideal Ortiz, who is my neighbor in, my, in the Eastern community and uh, a champion of engaging with people at any and every level in all communities. And I so appreciate you pouring in on this. Um, thank you and I wanna give you a high five. Um, this, I, and I know that um, I, I usually, transportation for me has been the kind of hard to access or hard to even understand um, area. And I think from just being a resident in the community, the difficulty of trying to navigate it um, help to, to kind of shape where I am now and how I work today, because it was so hard to, to kind of understand where all these acronyms were coming in and who was making decisions and how the decisions were made. And so I just really wanted to thank the team and staff and, and all of the volunteers and those who are engaging with us on this and, and helping to make sure that the people in the community understand what's happening, how it happens, and who, who is making the decisions so that we don't end up like we did with the um, kind of backlash out of different projects moving forward without folks being engaged. And so I, I just, I'm just very thankful. Thank you, much appreciated. Yeah, just, and just to, uh, if I could, just to make sure that it's acknowledged that we had a lot of assistance from Neighborhood Improvement Services on our equitable engagement following their blueprint that they developed and also with the planning department. Uh, without those two groups, we really couldn't have moved forward with, with the engagement process that we did and with IDEAL and, and everybody else who helped out. So just wanna make sure that's known. Thank you very much, Mr. Kane, and thank you, Council Member. Council Member Freelon. Yes, um, I just wanted to echo Council Member Freeman's sentiments and to thank staff and to thank you, especially IDEAL, for your 
presentation. It was good to see you. Yes. Was that yesterday? The MTO meeting? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, just talking about the levels of engagement down to the, you know, bilingual with Caribbean Spanish. And, you know, I just really appreciate the, the presence that you're bringing to our engagement strategies. And um, also for me too, um, I'm on the MTO board with, with Charlie and, and Mayor Shul told me this is going to be a big learning curve. And it is, it's a lot of acronyms. It's a lot of information and it's been probably the heaviest lift for me to understand and seeing these presentations, especially like this week, we had a prep meeting Monday. We had another meeting Tuesday. We had MTO yesterday. And then today, I feel like I'm slowly beginning to wrap my mind around this kind of gargantuan system. And, uh, and it's, you know, your, your presentations and the, and the staff and the work that y'all do is so helpful in helping bring me along. So I've been quiet, just kind of listening and I'm still listening, still learning, but I just wanted to thank y'all as well. Council Member Caballero. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciated this presentation. We did get a version of it yesterday, which is actually helpful to see it two days in a row to really <laughs> sink in uh, and, and understand what's happening. I just want to really uplift the work that, you know, we're seeing in so many spaces that staff is doing. I think it's, you know, it's informing our comp plan, how PV is run, um, and and we are seeing the fruits of, of really just hard work. Uh, I'm eager to see what, you know, the next, what the response will be to the scenarios. Um, I know we will not get this again for a few months, but I, I'm hopeful that some of, you know, we've heard, we've learned some hard lessons with the light rail, and I hope that it seems like we're applying those lessons that we learned in this process. Um, I know there's still a lot of really challenging components, the funding, uh, some of the issues that Councilmember Reese brought up during the uh, commuter rail update. Um, uh, you know, all of those, I'm very present with all of those issues, um, but I'm also really, really hopeful um, that we're going to get this right and we're going to do it better. Thank you so much, Councilmember. Any other, uh, Councilmember Middleton? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Aaron and Ideal, thank you. It's good to see you both and uh, happy holidays to both of you. Uh, Councilor Freeline, for whatever it's worth, I still feel the same way after almost completing a whole term there. It's just a lot goes into running a great city. So uh, right there with you, bro. Um, thank you for this, this uh, presentation. Um, no city can be great until it crosses that threshold of accessibility by something other than a car. E every city on, on the planet that wants to consider itself great has to cross that threshold. Got to be able to negotiate it uh, and unlock all of the great treasures in the city without a car. So, so I really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing. A um, couple of questions. I, the online um, survey summary, the respondents, were the res did the respondents have to self-identify? Did they have to click or, or was, was a mass kind of um, uh, thing sent out uh, for folk to respond to? How did we get our online respondents? So I, I think the answer to your question is that they self-identified. Okay. We, we did not send different links to different groups. Uh, we, had a, uh, we had tried looking at doing that in the beginning, but then people would get it and forward it to others and forward it to others. And by the time, it, it just didn't, didn't work out real well um, in, in order to try and use separate links as, as a separate identifier. So for the most part, it's self-identified in terms of- Okay, so, so I'm, I'm a uh, uh, patron and I see a, a, a a flyer or a poster and I see a website that I can visit and mm -hmm. I go to it and then I can just click on the survey. Yep. Absolutely. How, okay. All right. Awesome. Um, I want to ask a question about the, the amenity score uh, and, and the bus stops. I see it says each bus stop assigned an amenity score. There are 798 stops considered poor. Um, how, how long have the amenity scores been, been employed? I would probably need to I send that over to either Mary Kate or even if Jay is still on here. That particular scoring rubric, I think, is relatively new, but Jay, you might be able to identify that a little bit better. But I don't recall seeing it in pet. I'm, I'm thinking it is, but but 
that doesn't mean anything. So I just wanted to. So if I if I could take that, um, Councilman Middleton. Um, again, my name is Mary Kate Marukian. I'm with Kimberly hi. Horn. I'm a hi. I'm a transit planner uh, working on this um, transit plan update. So the amenities score that was strictly applied for the purposes of this analysis for the work on this. We've been coordinating more closely with Go Triangle since that initial analysis was done to more closely align with an inventory that they completed looking at all the stops in Durham. The Go Durham stops have already been inventoried and that is the inventory that you see reflected on the screen. Um, the Go Triangle stops are, um, that inventory is happening now. So through that process, Go Triangle staff um, looked at all the amenities present at each stop. So that includes bike lanes, the type of sidewalk, presence of connecting sidewalks to crosswalks, the presence of crosswalks, and then the type of crosswalk, and then the amenities like bus stop lighting, area lighting, shelters, benches, that sort of thing. So initially, our analysis looked at just what's present, looking at different types of amenities. We've now shifted the analysis a bit to look more, focus more on basic levels of pedestrian accessibility. So looking at accessibility as it relates to sidewalks, crosswalks, um, is it an unpaved strip with a sidewalk, just kind of uh, differentiating between the different levels of accessibility, and then a separate analysis to address ADA accessibility, because those two are different. To say something is pedestrian accessible, that could mean there is a sidewalk, it is connected to a crosswalk, um, and there is a signalized crosswalk for pedestrians to use. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's a paved ADA compliant pad for someone um, in a wheelchair to use if they were getting to the bus stop or getting dropped off from the bus. So we are looking at it a little differently now. Um, as Erin mentioned, um, these images were put in a few weeks ago, so we've had, uh, we've had some time to kind of refine the analysis a little bit, but I, I don't want to imply that this is a scoring metric that Go Triangle uses currently. For the purposes of this analysis, um, that is how we were classifying the, the bus stops, just based on how many amenities they had. But now we've shifted to look at general basic levels of pedestrian accessibility and then ADA accessibility, if that's clear. That is an extremely helpful distinction and, and, and helpful primer. Thank you. Because the, uh, I mean, the number, um, anecdotally, we hear all the time just how bad some bus stops are and how dangerous they are and how dark they are sure. from folk who use them. And, and 798 out of 945, that, that seems like a really high number. And, and I just wanted to, you know, as, as an, if I were a non-policy maker, uh, you know, this average resident and company listening to this report, it, my question would be, is that 798, has that number gotten better? 798 relative to what? Is, is, is that, so I thought it was important to establish how long we've been using this score. Is that 798 down from 815 last year or has it gotten gone up or, um, but that's an incredibly high number. I guess the point is we, we have, we've got work to do, obviously, uh, on, on this important um, service for our people. And uh, I'm just grateful we're on it. Um, but thank you. That, that's it for me, Ms. Mayor. Thank you for that clarification. Sure, no problem. Thank you, Ms. Marukian. And uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, even though you've, you've uh, let's, let me just say you've moved over to the dark side. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but we're glad to see you in your new capacity. It's nice to be in the light for a little bit. Great. Council Member Middleton, thank you very much. Other questions or comments at this time, council members? Real council quick, Mr. Mayor. Member Reese? Sure, of course. Great thing about going last is that everything's been said, but not everybody's had a chance to say it. Um, I just wanted to, uh, as I did yesterday when we saw this fantastic presentation, um, say how much I appreciate the broad collaboration that is getting us where we need to be on this plan. Um, and um, everybody involved has a part to play in that. Um, and so the praise uh, needs to be spread around a lot. Um, and for better or worse, Council Member Freeman already heaped praise on the person I heaped praise on yesterday, Ms. Ideal Ortiz. Uh, so I don't, and I'm, she's not my neighbor, so I can't really, I can't really say that. But what I can say is that, um, that I'm really happy to have uh, Ideal's passion and uh, energy and her great ideas and way to motivate folks to engage with this process um, uh, in the service of uh, the Durham County Transit Plan. So Ideal, thanks for all you're doing um, for this and for other all the other work that you're doing right now. Um, and let me just, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to repeat much of what I said before, 
uh, about the commuter rail, but I think the Durham County, uh, the transit plan provides us with an opportunity to decide as a community um, how we want to spend our limited uh, transit dollars. And so I look forward to seeing these scenarios come forward uh, and seeing the public response to them uh, and also looking at how we make the numbers work to reach all the, the priorities that we have in our community. Um, and I think that's a thing we can do. Finally, I just wanted to say uh, to my colleagues, council, council members, um, Middleton and Freelon, um, you, you may have heard this before, but it's been my privilege to serve as a member of the city council for 1,829 days. Uh, and on each of those days, I am simultaneously confused, um, concerned that I'm way over my head uh, and trying to learn something new every day so that I can actually be decent at this job. So uh, just understand it does, that part doesn't get any better, um, but, uh, but you'll, uh, you continue to get uh, better at the job as you go forward. Uh, so anyway, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all I had to say about that. Thank you, council member. It's certainly true that in the transportation realm, they're, they're, uh, they're adding acronyms faster than we can learn them. That I'm sure of. Um, I do have a few words to say about this. Um, the, and I, I want to begin with the thanks. I, I am so proud of the equitable engagement work. And uh, Ms. Ortiz, thank you for your part in this. Thank you to our MPO staff and our transportation staff to, for making this real. And we've, we're seeing this now all across the city. And I I'm, I'm just want to express my gratitude uh, to former city manager Tom Bonfield, to our interim city manager Wanda Page, for taking this ball and running with it. I am just for our NIS staff, our planning staff, it's really great. Um, I want to also uh, shout out uh, Sean Egan. Hey, we got a we got a visitor. How you doing? Say a few words to us. Good. How you doing? Good. Great. What you doing today? What are you doing today? Ah, uh, homework. Mm -hmm. Homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she, she's make sure you tea. tell a little bit too. Chill a little bit too, he said. Thanks for the tea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's always the best interlude. Um, I want to shout out uh, Sean Egan. You know, I, I really think I'm going to, to put this gently, I would say we really had to, uh, all right, I won't put it gently. We had to elbow our way into the county transit plan. And um, I think Sean has done a great job being a wonderful advocate for uh, the city's interests and our residents' interests. And what we're seeing in the next few years in terms of the capital spending and so forth has really been influenced by uh, Sean's work and our needs have been very well expressed. And I'm really grateful to the MPO and to the county for also embracing uh, the expansion of our bus service, the transit cord, transit emphasis corridors. These are huge wins. And um, Mr. Egan, I wanna thank you for your leadership on that. It's been great. And I, I, I wanna thank Aaron, you all in the MPO and the folks in the county who aren't here today, but for really embracing that and, and thank you so much. Um, I will say, um, I just want to throw down a challenge for my colleagues because this is going to be something that you all are going to do and I'm not. I'm, I'm let's see, uh, putting it gently, I'm, I think I'm two decades over, older than all of the rest of you, any of the rest of you. And all of these projects are incredibly long-term projects. Um, the East End Connector, which is about to open, went on the books more than 50 years ago. How long have we been trying to get a regional rail system in the triangle? At least 25 years that I know of. We've gone down this road several times and it's gonna take a lot. It's gonna just, these are lo big long-term projects that take a lot of advanced planning and advanced effort. And so what I wanna, the challenge that I wanna give you all is this. We can't, we, we cannot choose between a great local bus service and great regional transit. We, these are both necessities for Durham. If our residents don't have access to the great jobs around the triangle, we're increasingly becoming a single metropolis. 
if our residents don't have that, re that, that access through a great system of regional transit, we are not going to be able to be the city we want to be for all of our residents. And if we don't have the local bus service that we need, the same is true. So I just really want you all to think about that. And I know that we have a resource constrained plan here. We should have a resource constrained plan. But what I'm here to challenge you to think about is this over the long term and over the next, next few years, not, not much longer than that. If we don't have the money that we need to do both of these things, create a great regional trip, be, to do our share, Durham share in creating a great regional transit system and to create the great local bus system that we need, then we've got to figure out another revenue source. I don't think we can just say, yeah, we're resource constrained and we're going to do one. We got to do them both. Um, Council Member Reese mentioned uh, the fact, you know, uh, talked about the, uh, what, the, what the referendum for this, this transit money really hinged on. And it really hinged on providing regional transit. Bus service was an important element of it, but it was definitely the second element of it. Uh, and I think that that's important as we go forward. We have to remember what the will of the voters was. That's not to say things don't change in the nine years. They do. Uh, but I do think that that's got to be an important uh, anchor as we think about it. Um, in the right kind of world, this would not be an issue. And Councilmember Freeman already referred to this earlier. If we had the kind of transportation funding split that we should have at the state level, if we had this kind of support that we should have at the federal level, this would not be an issue. There's no way that local funding should be bearing the, this level of burden for a system like this, but it's where we are now uh, and we have to deal with that. Just thinking a little bit about the history, when the, when the bond referendum first passed, the idea was we were gonna cooperate with Raleigh to build a commuter rail. You all remember that Raleigh, well, let's just say, putting it gently, wasn't ready. Um, so we then found a, a willing partner in Chapel Hill in Orange County to, to go with a light rail. $160 million went down that light rail tube in an incredible amount of effort and 20, you know, decade of, decade of planning. And now we do have a willing partner in Raleigh with a commuter rail. And I think that the big question, and Councilmember Reese referred to this earlier, is what kind of cost share can we get? That's going to be critically important. And um, that's not a negotiation. That's going to be a negotiation between the county commissioners that we don't have a direct role in. But I hope that we'll be putting as much uh, of our muscle as we can uh, behind what I would consider a fair cost split, a cost share with, with White County. And... Um, we are very much in the role that, that Orange County was with us during, with, for the light rail, which we are the, let's just say, Wake County has a lot more money. Uh, and they, there are many ways in which they, this is, uh, uh, the, the commuter rail is very much in service to a lot of their important needs and goals. And so that ought to be reflected in the cost share. And I, I trust that our commissioners will be driving the fair bargain that we all know that we need. Um, yeah, just, I'm looking at my, my notes, but I think that's all. I just, I really want to say to my colleagues, this is a big long-term, um, big long-term goals here that you all who are of a different generation than I am have really got to take up and solve. And, um, because it's going to take 20 years to be everything we want to be, and you know, at least 10 to be everything we want to be in this realm. Uh, it's, it, so starting the long-term projects, doing the really difficult planning, you know, taking risks that we don't know when they're, you know, when exactly they'll bear fruit. It's, you know, really going to be important work. Okay. That was probably too much, but there you go. Um, better than a repetition of the, uh, of the um, transit acronyms. Um, colleagues, any other questions or comments for any of our transportation folks? Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to really um, echo your sentiments in acknowledging that this is a very huge long-term commitment 
to making sure that our community has the resources to, to not have to just drive to work or to doctor's appointments or what have you. And I just wanna echo that, that this is, when I say like that move to an equitable engagement blue, blueprint helps to solidify our unified support across the city and the county so that we're all on the same page and ways in which, I know it probably felt painful in the first couple of months when I kept saying that, but now that we're here, you can probably see the difference. And I know that the, the conversations that you're talking about are being had and you know, we'll continue to keep pressing. I know that this, this team is very transit friendly and uh, I am, I'm committed. I just wanted to, to, to just let you know that in this, I am very committed to seeing us through to a very, a much cleaner, greener future with uh, rail and buses at the same time. And whether that's at the state or the federal level, those funds will be coming through. They are gonna have to, they're gonna have to pony up because we cannot do it by ourselves. And I know that this community will find revenue resources, um, whether they're private, uh, corporate, even uh, if we have to come up with a solar plant, whatever it is, we'll come up with it and we will make sure that it happens because I know we all have children in this and we're all making sure that our children have access to clean air and clean water and these things matter. So I just wanted to, I didn't want you to leave without a response. <laughs> I'm sure the rest of the council would say the same thing and I will, I will leave it at that. But um, I thank you for your leadership on, on making those points because it is a, it's hard in the weeds. We live in the weeds of like looking at plans and talking about you know all those acronyms that everyone doesn't follow. But we're getting there, and I'm confident. I really, I'm probably overconfident, but I'm I'm in it for the long haul, Ms. Mayor Shul. I know you are, Council Member. Thank you very much for those comments. I know that you are. All right, colleagues. Um, I think we've done it for this item and I want to express my appreciation to Mr. Egan, to Mr. Kane, to Ms. Ortiz, Ms. Marukian, and I may have forgotten somebody, Ms. Ganser. Thank you so much, appreciate you. All right, colleagues, uh, we're, we're down to the, um, getting towards the end here. Um, and I'm going to first um, ask, uh, the city clerk to talk to us about items one and two. Good afternoon, council. Uh, item one is the Raleigh Durham Airport Authority, the mayor's nominee for reappointment. That is your, your uh, decision and your prerogative on that one, Mr. Mayor. Yes, right. I just wanted to make a remind us that that's on the agenda for next time. Thank you. Okay. And number two is the safety and wellness task force appointment. Um, we have a, a, a listing of appointments, or no, of nominations that you've made for appointment. And um, under the category of community organizing, Shanice Hamilton has been nominated. Under public policy, Jennifer Carroll, Justice Involved, Cynthia Smith, and at large, Isaac Villegas, and Jesse N. Huddleston. All right. Um, is that all the categories? Yes. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and thank you, colleagues. Um, okay, uh, now we'll move to settling the agenda. And I think also, Manager Page, if you could give us an estimate on when we think we'll be hearing back on the um, violence interrupters. Yes, um, Ms. Mayor, thank you. I, uh, we will be bringing uh, to you at the January 7th work session, all options and costs um, regarding expanding balance interrupters. Uh, I, I have to say that we have been working on that every week. Uh, we do have to coordinate that work with Durham County as well as uh, the partners that they use in helping to um, structure that program as well as administer it. Um, certainly we had to become familiar with it ourselves so that we can answer questions for you uh, as well as bring along, you know, any others that, that we feel it would be relevant 
uh, during the discussion, but we anticipate at that meeting for you to provide us uh, with direction and we will provide you with options and funding um, as well as, you know, to include funding options as well as geographic options on how to, uh, how we would recommend expanding balance interrupters in our community. So that will be January 7th. Thank you very much, Manager Page. Can you also, uh, are you ready to settle the agenda? Yes, I am. Uh, with with one, one question, if I may. Um, sure. on, on item three, um, from my uh, listening, we were, uh, we are thinking that the motion is gonna be changed on that item to reflect the, the uh, discussion here, but we have it currently placed on the consent agenda. Is that? I think that's fine. I don't think anyone would object to that being on consent with a new motion. Colleagues, can I hear see some thumbs on that? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, with that, uh, I am ready to set the agenda uh, for the consent agenda. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a quick question? I'm sorry. Sure, of course you can. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, um, Manager Page, thank you so much. Good to see you. Um, I, I wanted to ask your, and I, I appreciate <laughs> Sorry. Appreciate the forecast. We can uh, expect to hear back. Um, based upon that January date, how, maybe this is for me as well, Mr. Mayor, this is manager, how, how realistic um, do you think it will be that this uh, any action we take on violence interruption, if we choose to, will not be part of the regular budgetary cycle, but could be taken on um, an emergency footing, um, uh, yeah, on emergency footing, or or should the city just realistically expect this to be bundled into the regular budgeting process? Can do you have any wisdom on that? I can speak to that right now. Uh, we there are sources that we can go to to provide one-time funding um, with the knowledge that any time one-time funding involves recurring costs into a future budget, that that becomes an automatic component of our base budget going forward. So that is, that is the answer. There, there are sources of one-time funding, including our fund balance, uh, including you know, other savings that we may have during an operating year. Uh, and certainly we do not pay for, particularly in an interlocal agreement uh, with Durham County, we, wouldn't, we would not pay for all of that up front. So it would be a prorated amount um, based upon the execution of the interlocal agreement to the next, um, to the beginning of the next fiscal year. So all of that would be part of the financial uh, consideration uh, in many of our interlocal agreements that we have with the county, we pay one twelfth of the amount uh, each month, and then we do a reconciliation at the end of the year. So, based upon the conditions of the agreement, you know, if if it's for for salaries and positions are vacant, you know, that is what constitutes our reconciliation to actual costs. Okay. Um, thank you for that so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. All right, um, Madam Manager, let's um, let's settle the agenda. All right. So for the consent agenda, we have items one through sixteen, and for uh, the general business agenda public hearings, we have items nineteen through twenty-two. Thank you very much. Uh, you've heard the manager's agenda. Can I hear a motion that we settle the agenda? So moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Freeland, seconded by Councilmember Freeman. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Aye. Councilmember Freeland. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. Colleagues, before we adjourn, I do want to remind us of our, of our schedule coming up, which is an unusual schedule. We have our Monday night meeting uh, as usual, uh, 10 days from now. 
But then the following day, the 22nd of December, we have a work session on a Tuesday uh, in order to make sure that staff and everybody else is able to enjoy themselves for the holidays. Council Member Caballero. Are we going to get the work session agenda a little earlier so that we don't have this tight a turnaround? We, you know, usually those two days helps. I will ask the manager if she thinks we'll be able to get some of that earlier. I have not had that discussion with the with the preparers or, or, or staff, but I can certainly follow up and provide an answer to the council on that. Madam Manager, okay. even just one day would make a huge difference. Thank you so much. Okay, we, 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 well, we'll get back to you on. We'll be doing a lot of reading over that weekend. I have to bake. I don't want to read. And we're going to be doing a lot of baking. You're so you can right. have the iPad there, be mixing, scrolling. It's fine. I've already made my Hanukkah cookies. I want you to know that. <laughs> Are we going to get to eat and those Hanukkah cookies this year? Yes, that's good. Good. I said, are we going to get to eat those Hanukkah cookies this Ooh, year? I should have at least held one up that you could be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Colleagues, Tonight's the first you. night, right? Tonight's the first night. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Colleagues, thank, thank you, you for an excellent meeting. I thought it was a really good meeting, and I appreciate you. And uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Take care. Adjourned.